how much capital did you start with? Uh, five figures. Five yeah. figures. Yeah. And what's possible basically with five figures if you do it right? It's possible to go uh, 100x from there. Arthur Chiang. The founder of Defiance Capital is a genius in the crypto investment world. Renowned for achieving a staggering 100x growth in his portfolio at its peak. Before I started the whole entrepreneurship crypto journey, I was probably 80% optimist and 20% cynical cynic. Can you give me an example of how you would express optimism and how you would express cynicism? The VC have this formal that they might miss out on the next Facebook, the next Apple, Google, right? If you miss out, the career risk is that, like, oh, you saw the deal you didn't invest, you're not a good VC. The cost of missing out one big home run is bigger than you invest in a few scams and yeah. go to zero. Yeah. You want to make sure there's one investment that thousand X and just return the entire fund. Let's say I'm your cousin and I'm like, oh man, Arthur, you did so amazing. I want also to do 100X or 200X with my 5K. What the hell do I do and how do I even start? During June, unfortunately, there's a crypto company that collapsed and dragged me and our company into a very challenging situation. I would say June is where shit hits the fan and it's like probably like the worst moment I ever experience in my life. What makes crypto such an amazing opportunity for anyone, anywhere, to build insane amount of wealth quickly? I think... Arthur, it's been a crazy last few years for all of us in crypto. Yes. And a crazy last, I'd say, 12 to 18 months, especially for you. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. Uh, it's improving. Um, yeah, definitely uh, much better compared to the last 12 months. Do you want to tell us who you are first? I am Arthur. I am the founder of Defiance Capital, a crypto native investing firm based in Singapore. Yep, I've been investing in crypto since 2017 and launched my own crypto fund in 2020. And over the past few years, we become one of the most active and recognized crypto investment fund in the space. We have invested more than 100 crypto startups and protocols. Um, yeah. You call yourself a cynical optimist. Why? I think this is a... The, f the favorite way I describe myself right now because uh, when it comes to life and especially in crypto, you need to be optimistic so you have you can move forward because the world are full of bad things. If you are only taking a pessimistic lens, you are just going to you know stop moving forward. You think this is futile. This is just not how I think one should live their life. But at the same time, you should not be blinded by the optimism to to get to a situation where you just take everything in the face value, uh, become too naive. So I think combining uh, the optimism and uh, like being cynical in terms of like how you see a lot of the crazy things in the world is, is a good way to balance out, uh, a, a good balance approach to, to the world and to crypto especially. Is it something you've been kind of doing for a long time or is it something, or you were more kind of optimistic person who went through some experiences and learned, basically learned this through the hard way? Or you've always been that kind of person who is like able to say, oh, actually, I'm very optimistic, but I know there is like, you know, bad surprises yeah. and things here and there. I, I would say I'm definitely a much more optimistic guy before I started the whole entrepreneurship and crypto journey. Uh, if you want to put a number to it, I was probably 80% optimist and 20% cynical cynic, but... Right now, it's probably more 50-50 or even, I would say, 40% on the optimist side and 60% on the cynic side because, yeah, like a lot of events and you do experience changes, yeah. Can you give me an example of like basically before crypto of what you would, how you would express optimism and how you would express cynicism because you said, okay, eh, eh, 80%, 20%, what does this, especially the 20% yep. look like? Yeah. So I think uh, I studied economics in university. And so I consider myself almost like a economist when I come in terms of how I approach a lot of the issues in the world. So economists usually tend to be quite rational, you know, approach things in a more logical manner. And I was always in a school of more like, I think that the free market can take care of a lot of things. So a lot of things that like 
too much human or government intervention is actually counterproductive. Uh, so, and actually when you come to crypto, uh, one thing that attracts so many people is because it's, uh, before the whole regulation become uh, more solidified, it was a complete free market in certain sense. You can fundraising, there's no regulation and compliance. I mean, the government did publish a guidance uh, after it became very popular, but during the first phase, it was wow, wow, west and the complete free market. So that actually attracts a lot of the, you know, ardent free market believer to see, oh, you know, we can create so many things. There's so much potential. We can move so fast without all this uh, cumbersome regulation. And then after spending six years in crypto, you realize that um, a lot of the so-called um, flaws is something that the complete free market cannot fix. Uh, so that kind of, land, and also human are just, extremely terrible in general uh, in organizing governance. I, I would say like there, there's a phrase in crypto, actually it's not, it doesn't come from crypto. We call it the Moloch. So Moloch is like a deity that is like a, they, 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 we describe that as an issue of the human coordination. Like Moloch is what caused human to be unable to coordinate. And this actually happened to crypto. Like crypto, uh, I would say to a big extent, we largely fail at self-regulation. So that the industry itself did not manage to self-regulate itself to a level where it can grow in a sustainable manner. Like it, it basically, uh, we, we go to, we reach a stage and I still, uh, uh, it still is right now, we have an extreme boom bust cycle. During the bull market, the good times, we go crazy. And during the, the bad times, we go very bad. Like, they, they, the, like in the real world, you see this thing being smoothed out by the government and by policies and regulation. But in crypto, there's no such thing. Yeah. Does this mean that you don't really believe in full decentralization? Do you think it, it's possible for people to organize themselves when everything is fully decentralized and you don't have a third party to kind of play the bad cop? Yeah, I think this is possible, but I, there's actually, uh, I think this is uh, an area I think that crypto do not really need to reinvent itself because over the past few thousand years, humanity have gradually progress toward like a better form of governance but it took us so many years so many lessons experience to get there and I, like if you want me to give like a concrete example like Switzerland right have probably one of the most robust and educated democracy in the world like it's one of the few countries in the world with a direct democracy where a normal citizen civilians can put up a proposal and if they get enough signature, they can put it out for voting. And if it passed, it become a law. Um, but this is obviously conditioned on a situation where everyone is very educated on their civilian and citizenship duty and are informed on the issue. But this is actually very hard in uh, in a situation where the voters or people who are making decisions are not that well informed and that will lead to a terrible outcome. So I think the department in crypto is, there's no way you can identify whether these people are uh, educated, are they informed of the issue or are they actually malicious because anyone who acquired a token can vote. And this is still a, a big unsolved issue right now. So I do think that a lot of the protocol, like the more lower in terms of the technical stack you go, the more decentralized you need to be. So uh, there was a very good article written by one of the Bitcoin OG, uh, Nick Sable, if I pronounce his Sable, name correctly. Yeah. Uh, he, why he's such a pro Bitcoin is because he 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 think that uh, Bitcoin reduce a lot of the governance complexity and this create social scalability because it's so simple you don't need too much governance input so everyone can understand it very quickly and people know that it will not be ch none of the parameters or whatever can easily be changed so this lead the whole governance the whole uh, process and knowledge to be able to scale very quickly. The more complicated the governance process is, the harder it is to be scaled. So he, he called the term social scalability. Yeah. So I understand that, but you could also argue that if it's more rigid, like the Bitcoin protocol, you basically can build anything on the top of that. And so the progress that's possible and what you were saying before, you know, what attracts a lot of people is everything that's possible. Yep. Without regulation, with yes. decentralization, with, oh, okay, we start with Bitcoin removing banks, so the toll collector, but then how we, you know, building a decentralized internet, building decentralized, I mean, pretty much everything 
that's probably not going to be done with Bitcoin. Yep. Yes. So that introduces a layer of complexity that makes the whole thing almost impossible. Yes. So I, I think, uh, uh, like I say, like the lower in terms of the, the more foundational your technological layer is, the more you need to be socially scalable, which is why Bitcoin is uh, one of the foundational layer of crypto. Uh, it's like a decentralized money. That's it. The It's hard. Uh, it's intended to be hard to build application on it. And I think this is also one of the ways that Bitcoin continues to be the most valuable crypto because it's so simple and easy to understand. It's hard to break as well because it is simple and it's hard to put complexity on top of it. Although that is actually changing this year, like there has been a new like a tools uh, that you can mean NFT using something called an inscription. They call it the ordinals. So they actually have bring mm. some technological uh, innovation to, to Bitcoin. But for the last 12, 13 years, Bitcoin is a very simple tool. And because it's like a foundational layer, obviously the higher in terms of the technological stack you go, you optimize. So like it's, a, it's a spectrum. For Bitcoin, you should optimize for uh, like social scalability, uh, but feature poor. But if you on the more you going up to the tech stack where you want to build some feature rich uh, applications, then I think it's getting harder and harder to be fully decentralized because then you need to be iterate fast. Let's say you're building a consumer facing applications. If you are not able to innovate at a certain pace, like what your competitor is doing, you get out competed. Yeah. And in that sense, does it make sense for these application to be as decentralized at Bitcoin? I do not think it makes sense. And it's impossible for such product to uh, compete uh, on a feature and product level if it's that decentralized. You talked about Switzerland. Yes. How do you think Singapore is doing? Uh, in what sense? Which spec? Which part? So in the way, basically, the, the, the country is run. And in the way, I mean, here there is, I mean, some people say it's almost a, uh, uh, not dictatorship, but you know, like closer yes. to the Chinese way of doing things yep. than, the, than the Swiss way of doing things. But actually, Singapore at, at least says that they're trying to copy a few things from Switzerland. Yes. How, how, how well do you think they're doing at that? I think uh, the better way to describe Singapore is a illiberal democracy. Yeah. So like in the US and Europe, you have liberal democracy and Singapore is an illiberal democracy. It's still a democracy, but it doesn't blanket receive the liberal values uh, of the Western world. Uh, it, I think there's a lot of learnings that Singapore is incorporated from Switzerland, but Singapore is trying to chart its own way. Uh, in that sense, I think I, I, would, I would say Singapore have done a fairly good job in a sense. Uh, and also this has to come from a perspective of the geographical location and the historical reason. Like, uh, so we, we talk about Asia. I would say when it comes to um, like pure politics and governance, Singapore, if you measure on a holistically multiple factors, is, I would say, top five for sure. Probably it's not the most democratic country and like you know, the freedom it gives to the citizen are not as much as compared to Taiwan or Japan uh, and uh, Korea, mm -hmm. but it's definitely in the top five or top ten in terms of, you know, you, you have a lot of uh, freedom. Uh, and you know, uh, the citizens are actually able to voice their their concerns to to the government, and government actually do incorporate this feedback seriously, so that the, it, it it doesn't get uh demonstrated in the form of protest or you know we go on the street. That's just not the way that the the, the Singapore like Asia work in general. Like there's less protest and rally, but there is a uh, some feedback mechanism for the citizenship to wo voice their concern and unhappiness. And usually, what we have seen is the, they do incorporate this feedback uh, and when the, the matter gets very serious, they actually take it very seriously, yeah. What's the mechanism for people to voice their concerns here in Singapore? Because my view coming from outside, right? And especially I came like, I mean, I'm, I moved kind of during COVID and I saw there was a lot of, there, there, there was something that people, Singaporeans and non-Singaporeans -Singapore, would talk about, which is, kind of the opposite of what you're saying. People are not really allowed to say what they want here if it's something bad. And it doesn't even get reported in the media, for example. Yeah, so I, I think that um, it's the freedom of the speech we have here is definitely not comparable to US and Europe as well. 
Uh, and in terms of the media, so obviously <laughs> SPH is funded by the government. Uh, they are definitely, you know, going to be uh, like a lot. There's more house. I, was, I wouldn't say it's like an outright government censorship. It's like a self-censorship. So they, they will be very careful and they want things to be backed by facts. So I think this is something that what I experienced in Singapore, like is is you cannot just make a outright allegations that is not backed by any proof. Like any, I, and I, I would say sometimes they, mm. the government, the burden of proof they require for you to just to make a statement is a bit too high. Like in US, you can just say, Donald Trump is crazy or whatever. It doesn't matter. You don't even need to back it up with any proof. You can just say someone like Obama is a Muslim and, and it's, you're fine, right? But in Singapore, you just can't go out and say uh, some politician, he is someone, someone like without using a proof. But if you actually have a proof to back it up, the government cannot just say, oh, jail you or like, you know, uh, say, you know, poff my you. I actually do, do like there's a... Obviously, there's this huge controversial law about that the media censorship law is called POFMA. Mm. But actually, that is to correct uh, if you make a like a wrong allegation or statement. If you actually, you can stand by your facts, that is, you, the government actually can't issue a POFMA order to you. Like if you have a facts and evidence to back up your statement. So I think this actually, the, the, there's a good and bad to it. Um, but the good thing is obviously it, it makes it harder to spread false news and false mm. rumors. Yeah, but again, this is a very delicate balance. I'm not saying the government have you know, completely right. Sometimes they're a bit too over zealous in issuing this POFMA order. And this, leads, this also, in a sense, indirectly lead to a culture of self-censorship because people are worried of getting this, you know, POFMA order. They tend to be a lot more careful of what they are going to say. Yeah, so it's, it's a delicate balance. Yeah, but um, uh, I think the feedback mechanism, a lot of time is uh, media actually does matter. So like, I do think that the government actually care a lot about the media feedback. Like, you know, when some 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 of the news come out, you look at the comments on the social media, like Facebook or like yeah. uh, Instagram, whatever. Can control uh, it. Or even LinkedIn, right? Like if it gets super bad, they actually, I think the government do realize it and they will okay. take that into account for the future decision making. And also when it comes to the more business side industry, there's always the industry and the trade group that will, uh, like they will solicit feedback from the industry uh, associations whatever before they make a further decision but whether will they take the feedback and incorporate that is another issue uh, i mean and i think crypto industry unfortunately like if on the end that we our feedback get incorporated less <laughs> by the government compared to a lot of the other industry where government think that oh you guys are more credible i think after what happened last year there's one thing that have taken a hit like the, the credibility of the crypto industry have taken a hit in to the eyes of the government yeah how bad is it? Because when I came here two years ago, it was really, uh, oh, I think Singapore is really, uh, you know, advanced compared to a lot of other countries. But I also realized because I lived in Geneva before, I was in Dubai, that a lot of countries, they kind of market themselves as crypto friendly since many years already. Yep. When it's not really true, right? Even opening a bank account if you're a crypto business is very difficult. Yes. How much do you think Singapore is advanced in terms of crypto adoption and and acceptance yeah so i, I think despite what happened last year yeah so i i would say that i probably would not i, I think it's also correct to say Singapore is crypto friendly, but that is actually uh it stems from the fact that Singapore is business friendly they are not particularly mm. crypto friendly they are business friendly as a result it doesn't matter what industry you're in as long as it's not an outright illegal industry or an industry that Singapore government doesn't want to have in the Singapore like drugs or firearms mm. they will allow you to do business here but how much support they are putting in uh is is another question so I think in that in that sense I do not think Singapore government is putting a lot of resource to encourage the growth of the crypto industry but on, only on the blockchain part. So they 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 always uh, they, they they make that statement multiple times on MS and the government ministers. They say, oh, they they support tokenization. They support the blockchain technology to improve uh, the human life or whatever. But they don't encourage speculation. So they they are always in the sense that uh, there's a love hate relationship there. They know that crypto is a. You, 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 it's very hard to completely separate crypto from blockchain, but they are still trying. Yeah. So they don't really like the crypto speculation part, but they recognize that there's potentially some value on the blockchain technology part that they can incorporate, which is why MS, you keep seeing them doing all these kind of Project Guardian, Project Ubin to incorporate blockchain technology. Although, I, I mean, coming from a more crypto native kind of view, I think, it's, it's, I think that if you take away all the crypto part, the blockchain is just... Uh, it's not like that superior of a technology. Mm. Yeah. Like I think you need crypto because that 
facilitate open source economy, open source network, and it is a coordination mechanism. If you completely take away the crypto part, the whole coordination mechanism just did not exist. So then you're just left with, uh, you can even say it's like a slightly inferior form of database technology. Yeah. Yep. More expensive and slower, actually. We are doing this podcast from Singapore. Yes. We both live here. But you didn't grow up here. Yep. You grew up, you were born in Malaysia. Yes. You grew up in Malaysia. What happened in your life before crypto and in your childhood that made you become such a high achiever, someone who has like so much fire in the belly and who is so resilient? Yeah, that that's a good question. Uh, I do not think there's any like special turning point or events. Uh, I grew up as like a very standard, I would say, middle. I was probably even considered lower middle class in Malaysia. Uh, my parents is like a blue collar worker, but they do they they did uh like very willing to invest in our education. So I went to a very good school in Malaysia. Uh, and as a result, I'm able to come to Singapore for university. Uh, is, it, is it the goal for most Malaysian high achievers to do a uni in Singapore? Was, uh, it, was it for you a clear path? Okay, mm -hmm. if I do this school, I'm going to move to Singapore afterwards because that's where the opportunity is. Or how did this happen? Yeah, actually, no. I would say uh, coming from, like, I was in one of the best uh, Chinese school in Malaysia. Uh, Singapore is the is top choice because of the... Uh, cost effectiveness uh, is give you a relatively high quality of education with a more acceptable uh, like a co tuition cost and uh, overall cost and you can also uh, take a tuition loan and, I, and I, I came here not on scholarship but on tuition loan actually uh, from the Singapore banks uh, and obviously uh, that, that is a good financing option that is not that uh, easily accessible uh, for other countries I would say if actually that like if cost is not a factor most of the top Malaysian students actually want to go to UK uh, and US. I would say UK number one and probably US number two. Uh, Singapore is probably number th uh, the third one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the prestige and in terms of the, you know, where they would really want to go. So for you, you were thinking, I want to leave Malaysia because there's more opportunity in these other places, UK, US, Singapore. I'll have to take a loan. Yes. So I'll go to the place where it's kind of most cost efficient and yes. I might just have the lowest loan and the best education, like yes. this kind of trade-off, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. When was that? I came to Singapore on 2011. Right. So what did you do after that? I landed a job in BP, uh, a multinational oil and gas company. I joined uh, their management associate pro actually it's more like the a trading associate program in their oil trading division singapore is uh the largest commodity trading hub in asia so a lot of these big oil and gas company they have their oil trading uh, oil and gas trading division in singapore so uh, i i landed a job there i worked there for almost three years before i joined the crypto space full-time how did you feel going to work every day for an oil and gas company did you feel like this is the logical next step for me after university or did you have already this thing within you that was saying, I can't stand still here, I need to do something? No, I, I think that is uh, it's, it's actually what, uh, what I want to do uh, because, I mean, uh, since very young, even you know, before I come to NTU and Singapore, I always wanted to work in a more uh, so-called market-facing role, uh, whether it's on trading, whether it's on investment, whether it's on research. So that's always my aim. So obviously, I also uh, consider to work at banks or like, you know, asset management company before. Uh, but ultimately, the best offer I got is from BP and, and it's also a market-facing role and Singapore being a commodity trading hub is also a good place and a good career path to be. This make me join uh, BP, yeah. Did you like your experience there? Oh, yes. Uh, and I think this is a, a very formative and a very good experience for me because the good thing about being in a big company is they usually have a structure, a training program for fresh graduates. And I would actually say that this is very valuable because uh, when you are just out of school, there's a lot of things you do not know. And actually, it's good that you undergo a more structured kind of training program to get the basic foundational stuff learned first 
before you go on to chart out chart it out on your own. Yeah. So I think that that three year I spent on BP is a very good. I make a lot of good friends there. A lot of them I still keep in touch. You know, I learned a lot of uh, you know, you know, a lot of way of business. You know, of professional working ethic. Uh, which I, I think is something that um this is probably straying a bit uh, off topic, but this is something I think crypto sometimes a bit lacking, especially on the younger generation. Like some of the people who join crypto space right out of school, they unfortunately miss the whole uh, opportunity to build a good business, like a work ethic. And this is something that crypto is not really good at because everyone just want to, oh, look at the market, very distracted and always want to trade their own thing. But if you work in a big company, it actually help you build a character and a business and work ethic. Does it mean you don't back founders who are just straight out of university? Because what, of what I, I was about to ask before you said that actually, would you back or did you back people who are straight out of uni or just just stopped university to start a crypto company? Or you're still thinking, oh man, I want people, I want to optimize my chances of success in this extremely risky game, which is startups and in crypto, it's even more risky. And therefore, like, I think that people who work for a few years are more likely to become good founders. Yeah. Generally, we would prefer to back experienced founder, not mm. fresh graduates, but there are always exceptions. There are always some very brilliant team and co-founders that even though they are fresh graduates, they are just so brilliant. They are like a subject matter experts that despite the lack of uh, official working and business experience, it's still worth backing and investing in them. But obviously, these are far and few betweens. Uh, yeah, and, you know, there was a, I, I forgot which, which uh, university did the study. There was a research showing that uh, the a veterans uh, executives tend to have a higher success rate of founding a company. Like the median age of successful founders is actually 40, 40. years old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 40 same. years old. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, and also like, you know, after they accumulated enough industry contacts, connections, Absolutely. Um, you know, they have some funding, you know, they, this always increases your chance of success. But there's always exception, right? Like you, Elon, like not you say, um, Mark Zuckerberg yeah. and all this, you know, like Carousel in Singapore. It, there's always exceptions. What's really interesting is how our perception is basically wrong because we are all thinking, I mean, I take my example, but like most of our generation, we're thinking that, yeah, you need to start when you're super young and, you know, because it's harder and then you take more risks. Yes. If you have a family, but it's clearly shown by this study that people who are 40 years old are more likely to be successful founders. Yes. Which for some reason we, yeah, it's much less sexy to think about a 40 yes. years old founder than yes. a 22 years old founder. <laughs> exactly. Who is uh, starting a company from exactly. a basement or a garage. Yep. <laughs> So you worked three years in oil and gas. When did you start investing? When and, and how did it kind of happen? Because a lot of people actually don't think about this stuff until 30, 40, yes. 50. Our parents' generation, it's more uh, my kids. I, I get married to someone. I buy a house, which is a sort of investment. Yes. Fine. But then I have my kids and I don't, you know, my kids is expensive. Maybe I have one, two, three have to pay through their life, their, their school, all that stuff. And only when the kids are out, you're probably 50, 55, maybe 60, you're like, oh man, like I should start thinking about retirement yes. and invest, right? Then there is all other people who are extremely entrepreneurial and from extremely young have this thing from within themselves, which is, I don't know, I want to invest. Like I want to, to make, to turn $1 into $5, right? Yes. That I think is more... You. Yes. How did this start? Uh, I think it started where growing up, uh, our families, I think because my parents, they are not super well educated. They are not very good in financial, like personal finance management. So as a result, uh, you know, they, they, they committed to a lot of the not so good financial decision, like investing in the wrong things, you know, uh, you know. So this is always like instill like a big uh, kind of lesson that, you know, it's not just about how much money you make, but it's also about how good you are at managing it as well. So, how did you know when you're younger that they're investing in things that don't work? Do they share this at no. home, or do you feel in the life quality, or like, or in the mood of your parents, or like, how do you even know? Because you're a kid, right? Yeah, because I mean, uh, like they they will argue over money. Uh, uh, this always become like a common topic argument. I think this is fairly common in 
Asian family where Absolutely. argument over money. Yeah. Uh, because you know, it's there's always not enough money <laughs> to use. So that when when as a kid you see so much argument about money, the, it, it leaves a big impact to you that you know just stress the importance of a good financial management, like how important is it to to happiness in the family and also just individually as well. And also removing the stress. Yeah. Why is money so important in Asia? Because I don't think that Asian households or couples are doing necessarily worse than European couples or American couples, right? Yeah. But as you said, and I've heard it so much from my Asian friends yes. or girlfriends, so many arguments about money. Yes. And actually, actually a lot of trauma for the kids yes. to hear these and like sometimes like um, threats of divorce and all that stuff yes. all around money. Why is money such an important topic for Asian families and couples beyond beyond the basic, which is you need enough money to survive, obviously. Like. Yes. Um, I think it's also, uh, okay, I think there's two factors. Uh, there's probably more factors. Uh, I think one is like Asian society generally are poorer. <laughs> this is a fact, you know, when you look at the like, economic data, uh, Asian uh, countries usually have a lower purchasing power uh, even okay, so there's it's a two way to look at it, right? Uh, um, gross like a GDP per capita and income per capita. When you look at it, uh, the ratio of uh income per capita compared to GDP per capita in Asia is actually generally lower than US and Europe. Means that as a percentage of the total economic output of the country, the income le less percentage of the income go to the household compared to the Western countries. So why is it there's a lot of, you know, probably government take more out of it, you know, there's a lot of indirect taxes or what is like unfair distribution of the revenue between the company or workers, whatever. There's a lot of reason behind it. So like it's just the, the pressure of the money is it's just very high. And actually, when you look at a lot of Asian country, uh, you as you look, realize that the, the cost of living are disproportionate compared to the income. Yeah, it's like in Malaysia... Uh, and I would say probably in like, even China, right? You look at it like the the things are like, obviously you know you, you look at it in US dollar terms things are cheap, but if you look at local currency term, it's very expensive, especially compared to the salary, the median salary of the the population there. What do you think about Singapore on that? Singapore, end? I think it is uh one of the better one in Asia for yeah. sure. Uh, but if you want to compare to US, it's actually still I would say below US. Kater, no? Yeah, because <laughs> it's yeah. like the, there's a lot of indirect tax and some of the biggest component. Of spending in Singapore are still very expensive, but it, we Singapore is better than a lot of Asia country for sure. Like like you know, just a comparison. Like we take Starbucks, right? Like Starbucks costs like five to seven dollar here, and median household income in Singapore is seven thousand Singapore dollar. In Malaysia, median household income is ten thousand ringgit. Uh, but a Starbucks costs like fifteen to twenty ringgit in Malaysia. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you don't have to drink Starbucks, but. You know, we're taking an international brand to, to use as a benchmark. And the young people in Malaysia do love drinking Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I think that that's one reason. The second reason is obviously uh, uh, cultural. Uh, I think especially for Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, ethnicity, uh, money is always one of the biggest, uh, you know, like elements in life, right? Like during Chinese New Year, we wish each other, we should have a good fortune, uh, you know, wish you become wealthier like this is literally the way we uh, we greet each other during Chinese New Year Lunar New Year right so it always become it always a very big element of uh, of the of the culture and because generally most Chinese uh, especially in China and I think in Southeast Asia as well a lot of us are, are, we are not like very devoted uh, in terms of religion like even their Buddhists or like Taoists it's not like very hardcore compared to other religions. So money is always kind of like, I wouldn't say it's a religion, but always be kind of like a central belief system that the richer you are, it means the better you are doing. Mm. Yeah. So that, that's always, I, I think that, that has something to do with the whole, you know, the whole argument about money as well. And it's also how you benchmark yourself because probably in some other religions, you you benchmark yourself saying, oh, I'm more religious. I feel better. This is also like a reflector in your social status. But in a lot of Asian culture, your social status is purely reflected by how wealthy you are. I mean, unless you you are like minister or whatever, but usually did, that doesn't really happen in most of the Asian country, right? You very small percentage of people are working in the government or are like, you know, ministers or what. Yep. So you see your parents arguing about money? Yes. And it 
kind of gives you this huge motivation to say, I don't want that in my life. Yes. So what do you, what do you do then? How old were you when you first invested? Yes. What did you do? How did you go about it? Yeah. So I, I actually bought my first stocks in 19 years old. Mm-hmm. I actually bought my first stock in, I opened a brokerage account in Malaysia and I bought my first stocks there. Uh, I sold it very quickly because, you know, I don't understand the stocks enough. Uh, but yeah, I started investing in 19 years old. And from then onward, uh, I was just keep on reading different investing books. I think since then, I probably read more than 30 books related to investing. So obviously all the classic of Benjamin Graham, yeah. Warren Buffett and like George Soros, all these like classics, you know, I probably read most of it. So yeah, so and during uh, university times, I'm very active in the investment clubs. Uh, I for, like just, I spent a lot of time doing various activities there. I was like the vice president of the club f- uh, for two years to, you know, to direct all the activities and also like on a research and education side. Yeah. You know, and actually, if you go to YouTube, you can still find a Channel News Asia art like video interviewing me when I was like 2013 uh, about it. like as a young I've investor. I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> yes. But not uh, preparing for this, but I've seen it like one or two years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, this is, um, I've been always been interested in investing since very young. Did you have a goal early twenties? You have, you say, for example, me, I was like, I want to retire before I'm 30 and I had a certain number in my mind. Obviously I didn't understand that the whole retirement thing is actually extremely boring and you don't even want it. But like, I was like, oh, you know, you have this kind of, did you have that? Or you were just thinking, I want to like build my craft to kind of. You know, we always say um, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So I want to prepare for the right opportunity and I don't know when it's going to be and what it's going to be, but I believe in the future and in my future and I'm preparing for that. Or you were like, I have this goal and this is my kind of plan to get to this goal by this age. I do have a plan, uh, like a goal, which is I say that I want to uh, achieve a 1 million net worth by 30 years old. Okay. Uh, that, that, but it's, it's more like just to put a number to the target so it become more v- visualized that you can actually like have a more concrete number in mind yep. uh, but it's not like something that uh, it's, it's just to put a number to it and, and it's also a fairly uh, I wouldn't say fairly it's like uh, it's, it's difficult but realistic I would say to a certain extent in Singapore it's realistic because Singapore the tax is not too high if you work in a high paying job you make hundred to two hundred thousand annual salary. You save. You invest. If you do well in investment, you it's not impossible. It's difficult, but it's not impossible to achieve one million net worth by thirty years. So if you do well in investing and you get a high paying job, mm. yep. So what do you tell people today who say? Because you said one million. It's really interesting because if I talk to, I mean, my ex girlfriend now or any friends, it's always like, when I get to one million. I'll do this. I'll change job. I'll go travel. There's always this one million kind of number, right? Yes. Given all what happened, and we'll talk about that later, but like, and how much over that you were even before 30, what do you think, what would you tell these people who say, oh man, I, I, when, especially on the, on the, when I reach this number, I'll change my life, Right. I, uh, I, I, didn't, I don't really have this kind of specific, you know, to do things after I achieve that number. Uh, and I think the, 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 it's also part of the journey. Like where I think when, when you hit there, you just feel a sense of relief and like achievement. Uh, but in terms of, you know, like, are you like going to commit to, you know, like buy something, whatever, that is usually quite secondary. I think most people will will enjoy the whole sense of achievement more than anything that, oh, I finally can afford something or what. It's really the sense of achievement of like a, a target unlock kind of things. It's, it's a bit like playing game. You finally achieve some targets, you know. That, that is something that uh, feels more true to me. Like I set myself a challenging, not impossible goal and I actually did achieve it. And in a sense, ahead of the target. So that this is the kind of things that you, you feel a sense of achievement and accomplishment. Yeah, I, and I think that is something that is a better motivator. That's really interesting. So you felt really proud and you felt positive feelings when you reached that? Yes, for sure. Okay, because me, uh, I was like feeling lonely. I, mean, I didn't have anyone to talk. I didn't have anyone, especially when it's crypto related stuff. Yes. You, know, you don't, 
it's difficult to find people who you can talk about that with and who will really understand the kind of magnitude yes. of what's possible. Yes. So you end up feeling, at least for me, it was kind of like, I mean, before COVID, but let's see, like, there's this weird thing happening. You don't really you know who you can talk to about because they yes. don't even understand and you kind of end up feeling almost lonely. Yes. Yes. Never experienced that? No. Uh, I think this is uh, also part of the personal growth. So I think that uh, because my interests uh, uh, in investing and also crypto are just so different with most of my other normal friends uh, and you you will outgrow your your initial network of friends and so I think I think right now for me is like uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong and also I, I don't I, I'm actually pretty happy with it. It's like a lot of my good friends right now, they are in crypto industry. Like we we most of my good friends, most of friends I talk regularly to, uh, they are in crypto some way or another. Mm. And I think that's just a natural progression. You outgrow your personal network and your friends and then you you go and f- focus on a different thing and you naturally build your network and your friendship around people of uh, similar mindsets of like a uh, interest yeah so I, I think that's just what happened yeah I mean I did uh, make a lot of new friends in the space and obviously everyone can emphasize and resonate with each other because we are all experiencing the crazy things together mm. so you're super interested into investing you are you said president or vice president of the club at yes. the university. Yes, correct. Then you start your corporate job, which probably pays you decently well, and you can start, you know, the classic, I guess, save a chunk, invest in an S&P 500 or some stocks. Yes, yes. What happens then that was the kind of aha moment with crypto where you realize, oh man, this stuff is everything I thought about already in terms of investing, but compounded. And therefore, instead of investing a thousand bucks every month for 30 years, whatever, like I can do that and maybe achieve what I wanted in 30 years, maybe only in 10 years or maybe only in five. Yes. Or maybe only in one. Like yep. what's, how did you get sucked into this industry and, and, and what's kind of the key moment there? Yeah, I, I think that, First of all, uh, 2017 was uh, like a year of like a, like a, like I would say it's a year where Ethereum become mainstream. Yeah. Uh, Ethereum, I think, started the year at 2017. I think it's like 10 to $20. It ended the year at like three to $400. So it's like a about 30x return for Ethereum. And it become like a few hundred billion. Uh, no, I would say like, I think it was around uh, slightly less than 100 billion. So it went from like a, like a less than a like few billion market cap to almost like a hundred billion market cap in one year. Uh, and obviously that's like a exponential growth and that at naturally, and obviously there's a whole ICO thing going on. A lot of new token were being created. People talk about this like a newer form of crowdfunding. And obviously the ICO also make crazy returns. So you're, you not only make money on Ethereum, but if you also invest into the right ICO, you make even more crazy returns as well. Um, so that obviously, you know, uh, you know, as an investor, I just realized that I have to know what is happening, right? I, I cannot be missed out on it. And actually, before that, I was investing in the Singapore stock market um, and a bit of US stock market. And Singapore stock market was like uh, just very boring. Yeah? There's no growth uh, growth stocks to invest in, very little of them. And also, it's just like a very sleepy and boring market. And uh, there's also, I'm, I'm a very active guy. And I like to participate in the whole investment process. And the problem with investing in stocks uh, is as a minority shareholder, you are very difficult for you to make any changes to the investments. It, like, I'm something that I'm someone that was very obsessed about the whole investing process. So I like to like when I'm obsessed about it, I spend a lot of my time just, you know, every day after I finish work, I just look at it, look at the stocks, you know, look at what am I missing out on the information. But actually I still will not be able to make any changes mm. to this company I invest in. And also it's just not fun as well. So and uh, crypto is something different, like because you can actually be an early investor, you actually can shape the outcome. Uh, of the of the investment you made uh, you know like you, you are the evangelist right you are the one of the earliest guy that talk about it and promoted it in a way that actually you know you participate in the growth of this uh, investment how did you realize that that was the case because there is this thing for everyone I think where in the beginning you, you're like okay this crypto thing is interesting but it's kind of intimidating right so I, I'm, 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 I like to read so then when I 
look at crypto, I didn't immediately buy it. I actually spent at least like two weeks to read up on it. You know, obviously you go on internet, you'll find whatever the best source of information you can. You read out on it. What is the technology about? Does it have any intrinsic or fundamental value? Uh, you know, is it a scam or whatever? And after spending a few weeks of research, I my own conclusion is it's not a scam. Uh, it is a, a very early stage, uh, potentially promising technology. There's a, a lot of exciting application to be built. Whether it will be successful or not uh, is unknown, but it's exciting. And it's a global asset class where anyone from the world, as long as you can put your money into crypto, you can participate in it. It's uh, a little bit different from like, you know, like if you're Singapore stock markets, why would like, uh, you know, a citizen for other countries invest in the Singapore stock market? Like they do not know the company here, but crypto is inherently a global uh, asset in a way. And I think that makes it very exciting. What's one of the main points for you that made you realize crypto is not a scam, especially when Six years ago, I mean, some people still say it's a scam today, but like it's not as bad as a few years ago, right? Media. Yes. Um, especially when things go bad. It's a scam, it's a scam everywhere. It's a scam, I told you so. What's the key thing for you that made you really give you a lot of conviction that is not a scam and that you can kind of go all in? For me, for example, it was looking at who is dedicated them dedicating themselves fully into crypto. Yes. Balaji, Naval, all the, and I was like, these guys have been, they're so good in what they say about everything, investing, life, even spirituality, everything, right? Yes. And then I'm like, these guys, they're leaving everything for crypto when everybody else is saying it's a scam. Like, it's probably telling. So it's probably safer than what most people think, right? Yes. So what was it for you? I think it, come from my background as a, a more uh, pro-free market, uh, liberal kind of person, where I always think that uh, less government intervention is is better, you know. I'm always a more pro-free market person. So the whole ethos uh, of crypto and blockchain is always to promote uh, decentralization of power, uh, you know, and like, a, like a, as, a, as a coordination mechanism uh, as well. So this this whole this message just resonate deeply with me. And I do believe that uh you know in, in terms of finance and uh, I was like I was I was also very big into this whole economic history. I look at a you know some country where had they have high inflation, you know, a lot of the central bank government mismanaged their currency and as a result they have you know a lot of issues. So I think that that actually uh, naturally lead me yeah. to believe that crypto always have a value. But uh for me as an investor, the bet the more important question I ask myself is not whether crypto is a scam or not because I think that if you spend enough time that is not the right question to ask is does crypto have a lot more growth opportunity from here I, I think that is a question that is, is more important asking because it, I think a lot of things is binary in life right? it's like is US dollar a scam it's a lot of things a scam if you, if you take it to the extreme if you only adopt like a binary kind of everything approach is everything is a scam right <laughs> and I think that's not helpful right so for me it's more like is crypto a uh, a billion dollar, just a one billion dollar opportunity, or is it like a hundred billion opportunity, or is it even like multi trillion dollar opportunity? And I think that is a question that I I ask myself, and I do believe that crypto is not just a billion dollar opportunity. It is like a multi, at least a hundred billion opportunity. It can potentially be even a multi trillion opportunity, and obviously that kind of view turned out to be correct. That it right now the entire crypto asset class uh, market cap is one plus trillion. Mm -hmm. um, at the peak, it hit three plus trillion. So, and I think that going forward, we will always be at, at least a few trillion dollar in terms of the market capitalization of crypto as a whole. Can potentially go above 10 in five to 10 years if you know, the, all the uh, bull case did, do materialize. Yeah, but I think that is a question I ask myself and I do believe that at that point in time, given how small crypto is, uh, you know, given how fast the global wealth is increasing and given the geopolitical situation, that is just on a risk-adjusted basis, the, the chances of crypto going way higher Almost is just no way brainer. lower yeah. than going uh, going going down so like, yeah. on a longer-term basis. So it's always like a risk-reward and uh, on a risk-adjusted basis. Like, yeah, can crypto go to zero? Yes, it's possible. What if 2017, 2018, Bitcoin and Ethereum have a zero-day bug? It's actually possible. And even right now, I would not discount it to be zero. I think, but the thing is that even right now, it's a Bitcoin Ethereum, they have a zero-day exploit. The community, we can all agree to hard fork the code to a new one. So it's, it's fine. I think even right now, if Bitcoin Ethereum have a big vulnerability, we can hard fork the code to a new blockchain 
and the value can be retained because it's also part of it is also about the social consensus of which chain we believe is the real Bitcoin and is the real Ethereum, right? And that's how the whole historical Bitcoin hard fork, the Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin, the war come from, right? So, but at that point of time, when the industry is not that mature, 2017, 2018, mm. if you have a zero day, can they go to zero? It's actually possible. But I still think that uh, on a risk-reward basis, the chances and probability of crypto going higher is way lower, way higher than, you know, crypto going to zero. So you, based on probabilistic count scenario, you should invest in crypto. Yeah. How did you do this transition into crypto? Was it, I have a normal job and I'm starting to invest in there with the intent of going full-time or at some point you just say, I'm going all in? How did it happen? Uh, obviously, I just started from investing in crypto. Uh, you know, as a, as a just an, as an investor. Uh, when did you buy crypto first? Twenty seventeen. So uh, in the bull run. Uh, in the bull run, yes. I bought my first Ethereum and read it was at three hundred dollar. Okay. And uh, so, but uh, the, the more time you spend in research, the, the rabbit hole just keeps sucking Crazy. you in <laughs> because there's still so much news and you get the dopamine here yeah. and <laughs> it just, it just, it just keep uh, coming you back, especially uh, when market is going up. We all experienced that FOMO before and when, like you feel like there's just so much opportunity, the market just have so much news and it, it started becoming a bit distracting and you just start to uh, get sucked into the whole rabbit hole and believe that, you know, it's so powerful and so exciting and you need to be part of it. So, you know, after spending like a few months doing research and thinking deep about it, I decided to just do this full time. So that's why when I made a decision to quit my job, uh, obviously it's a pretty high risk decision to do to, to, to pursue crypto full time. So I, I I left BP to uh start my own crypto startup. I want to initially I want to build like a crypto data and research platform. Yeah. But uh that startup the uh, didn't work out in the end. So, but what I found the most success actually is in investing. Yeah. What did your parents say when you said, I'm going to leave my three years well-paying job that's safe to start a crypto-related startup? Yeah, so I, I think I kind of like didn't tell them too much details because <laughs> there's just no point uh, making them worry too much. I just say, oh, I'm going to work for another different company in a different industry. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I didn't exactly sell that, tell them I'm working for myself. <laughs> So you do this research, right? A couple of weeks. And then you're like, man, this thing is amazing. What's the combination of factors that makes crypto such an amazing opportunity for anyone, anywhere to build insane amount of wealth quickly? You talked about the fact that you can participate early before. What else? Because there's a few factors here that make this kind of asset class and industry extremely different from pretty much anything else? I think, um, first of all, it's permissionless. It means that anyone can come in and launch their own thing and invest in whatever things you want once your money is in crypto, right? So that naturally make it a global asset class. And there is always a certain level of network effect in uh, even in the capital markets, right? Uh, which is why US stock market is one of the best performing uh stock market in the world in the last 20 years because everyone have access and need and have some uh, demand for US dollar. And when they have US dollar, they need to store their wealth in a US dollar denominated assets. Mm. And US stock market as one of the biggest and most liquid market in the world naturally attract the most capital inflows for investment perspective. And this same, same in crypto because most of the crypto are US dollar denominated. Uh, and also um, it attract inflow from globally, like China, whether you're Chinese, you're American, European, you know, Middle East, everywhere, you are able to access crypto. So I think that uh, kind of thing is something that doesn't really exist in if you're not a US stock market. Like if you're like a South Korean stock market, you have capital control, I cannot buy your stocks, you mm -hmm. know, uh, this situation and all like you're a European stock market, but it's like what European company, I don't understand what is it doing. And it's like, and what they're, the product and services they're building is largely only relevant, relevant to Europeans or like, like in France or whatever. So that kind of thing, you just create a dynamic where it's so global in nature, it doesn't have any geographical restriction, even though you're like for Africa, you can identify with Ethereum, right? You don't have to be certain nationality or whatever to identify with Ethereum. So that makes it a global asset class so it can attract a global inflow. So that also means that it can have a exponential growth. And because it's permissionless innovation, the, the whole uh, industry and a uh, certain uh, crypto as a whole can innovate at a, at a much faster pace compared to the 
non cryptos uh, and this is something that I I was also obviously since university I was very big into the whole startup culture and also that is also the time where Singapore government is actually actively encouraging the whole startup culture in Singapore I think when they see the first batch of success in Singapore uh, Singapore government I think from like the early 2010s uh, onwards they start encouraging and investing a lot in innovation you have see the block 71 and I think Carousel was founded around 2013 2012 around there so that was like the first uh, and you know, a few years where a lot of the Singapore startups ecosystems they really start flourishing, and also that kind of you know, and also I read zero to one and all this kind of startup book, and just the whole permissionless innovation thing just make you believe that you know crypto as a whole can grow w- way faster compared to any other industry in the world. Yeah. So you go all in crypto first as a startup, and then what happens? Uh, so we. The timing was terrible because we started full time in 2018, and that was when the bear market started. It's like you cannot get a worse timing, and impossible to raise funding. Uh, because I mean, obviously, you know, we have some working experience, but it's nowhere near the level where you consider to be super experienced. And my co-founder gave up halfway. Uh, you know, and I mean, uh, I'm the I'm the non-technical co-founder. So in most startup, you need a technical co-founder to work. Uh-huh. So the technical for co-founder quit. Uh, so that make it almost impossible uh, to start. So I just decided that it's, it's going to be impossible or very difficult to do this, uh, you know, without the technical co-founder. Uh, and we, we, I did continue for a while, but after a while, you just realize it's, it's super difficult to secure further round of funding. And, uh, you know, without technical co-founder, you're just doing everything yourself. It's just almost like a mission impossible. And also the bear market just you know, go gross on you, right? You feel like, oh, the industry just keep going down, the price keep going down, everyone just retrenching, firing. It just seems like it's going to be a tough time, so I just stopped doing it. I, I just focus on transition to just investing instead, yeah. But still knowing that, I would say that's the massive difference between crypto and any other industry. Any other industry, if you really want to make it big, you need to build a company with IP and scalability and... That's how it works, right? Yes. But with crypto, you kind of have this plan B, which is, it's kind of weird, but like, oh, I don't need to build a business. Or if my business doesn't work, if I have some capital, even if it's not huge, I'm still able to make amazing returns that might be as good or even better than if I was building a really successful company in another industry. Did you feel that back then? So you were just, when, when this first startup doesn't work out, right? Did you feel that like in your guts? Like, it's fine. Like, because first, I mean, it's, it's complicated, complicated time, bear market, but also I still have my plan B, which is investing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't exactly say so because uh, the investing part is just coming that uh, I don't want to leave the industry uh, and I still have like some money. So the best thing to do is just to invest uh, instead of like, quitting the industry. And obviously, I was also looking for other jobs in the industry at the same time. So it's not like mm. I decided to become a full-time investor because I don't have that much money to be an investor forever. It's just more like I will do this uh, while I'm looking for other jobs at the same time in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's certainly true for a lot of people coming in. They think that I think that's also, I think you, you think about food. You only think about being a full-time investor when you already have certain amount of capital because investor means that your time frame is longer. But yeah. there are a lot of people, I think, that they think they can, they can just become a crypto trader without that much money and they can actually make it. And actually, there are some successful examples and I do know a few personally, uh, but it's not as easy as, as you think, but it is possible. And But I would say this is also possible in the US as well, in, in the US stock market as well. It's, also, it's not exclusive in crypto, but crypto somehow popularized the whole story a lot more than the US stock market yeah mm. until, until you have Wall Street bets I think in a, after that you know the whole Wall Street bet the meme coins and the meme stocks and option degeneracy yeah. cow is the same trend right like, <laughs> like the whole people who have 50,000 20,000 they put everything into like short term options and like boom 50x oh then they become a million dollar they like you, you go to the Wall Street bets reddit like the people who show that oh how much money they have made from like just putting 10,000 into some short term options <laughs> short term call options yeah, so it, this is kind of like a similar trend, uh, but but this is not just in crypto. I would say even in other markets, it's possible. But in crypto, definitely this has been well more popularized in some sense. The kind of gambling aspect, yes. Because what you're describing here with meme stock and degeneracy on leverage, like it's basically gambling. 
But in crypto, if you do a lot of research, you're connected to the right people. Yes. And you have some capital. There is gigantic opportunities that are, it's still risky, but that are much more legit than pure gambling. Yes. Where you have much more merit to it yes. when it works out. Yes. Right? Yes. And it's really what you've done, right? Yes. Can you tell us about this journey? Like when you started, how you kind of like, I mean, I know you were early in Ave Synthetics. Yeah. I think Axie also. Yes. How, how did you go, how did you find these projects? And again, for me, how do I apply that to broader people and audiences? It's how, I mean, first of all, I know, what did you start with? How much did you start with? Uh, in what sense? In investing. So how much, how much capital did you have to start uh, with? Like, like, if, uh, like uh, five figures. Five yeah. figures. Yeah. And do you mind sharing more or less what was like the, where you, what's possible basically with five figures if you do it right before things went bad? Uh, it's possible to go uh, 100x from there. Okay. So now... Based on my question before, and we're not talking a bit about gambling here, yep. right? We're talking about investing in a asset that has a lot of potential, a lot of risks too. Yes. How do you go about it? What do you tell your, let's say I'm your cousin, Kevin, I'm 20 years old. And I'm like, oh man, Arthur, you did so amazing. I want also to do 100x or 200x with my 5K, right? I have yes. 5K. Yes. What the hell do I do and how do I even start? Yeah, so I, I think the market has also changed. You know, my approach that was working very well back then uh, might not be as effective nowadays. Although I would say it's still effective, but uh, there are probably other other ways that can do that as well. Uh, I think this is a very cliche term, but I still think it matters. It's which really coming from a first principle perspective because this market has so much noise. You, If you do not have a first principle thinking, it's, the problem is people might share some very profitable and actually real investment strategy or framework, but how do you know to filter it out? Whether which one is something you should listen to and some, something that you should not, right? So it's, it's, so I think start from first principle of really thinking that are you trading or are you investing? And also, what is your investment philosophy? Like, are you some, are you, do you think that you are just a, a kind of trader that you don't really care? You, you just... Uh, want to make the most money and then you, you're okay to sell everything. Like you, so you need to first of all identify the kind of like personality that fits your, uh, like the kind of investment strategy and philosophy that fit your own personality. Uh, and then you go there to, to build your whole investment strategy and framework and process. So for me, I'm always more of an investor than trader. Although for me, sometimes the, blind, the line is a little bit blur in crypto. Uh, so for me, it's really that uh, this is coming out of the whole ICO bubble where there's a big question asked in the industry that what is crypto good for except for speculation, money, and fundraising? Uh, because a lot of the experiment failed. You know? There's so much ICO just completely go to zero. Right? There, there's people that they want to build anything on the blockchain and almost none of them make sense. So going from a first principle perspective, going to research, talking to people, uh, I, 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 can't, I, I, I narrow it down to really just, there's only very few use cases at that stage of the technology that it makes sense to incorporate crypto and blockchain. One of them is finance, which is why I, I was a very big believer in a decentralized finance because I think that this use case makes sense with crypto. But a lot of other things doesn't make sense at the moment. Like you want to put Spotify, you want to put Uber on the blockchain, it, you can potentially make it work, but it's just, you're trying to force something and it's just end up that you're competing on a lower feature, more expensive. But finance is something I think that right now the financial industry doesn't exactly compete on the cost. They compete on like being like an intermediary, like being a trust, all this thing, which is why I think that crypto and blockchain are well positioned to abstract away. Mm -hmm. And I think this is still true right now. Um, obviously there's a lot of issue, uh, but I think on, on a first principle perspective, I think that makes sense. So I think this make it worth investing. And I think in the sense that you can say that DeFi is a better form of fintech in a way because fintech, uh, I think right now to the, to the current stage of fintech, I think fintech doesn't actually bring anything new to finance anymore because whatever, the, you know, the, the fintech part that the technology can bring to the finance, the bank can do it themselves. 
the, the bank are doing this robo advisor themselves. The bank are doing all these things themselves. They're just probably a bit slower, but this is not something they cannot catch up in two to three years. So there's actually nothing really new that fintech is bringing to the financial world. But I think DeFi is fundamentally in a different paradigm. It is a different way of organizing the the financial world, which I think that um no, this is just a sector worth investing in. So this is what lead me to invest in synthetics, Aave, early on. And same for XC, which I think that, you know, after looking at so many other sectors, I think that gaming is also one of the very few sectors that makes sense with crypto. Uh, we published a thesis uh, about this one year ago in our company's uh, uh, website, uh, writing.defines.capital. Yeah, so I think, I think that's really, this is really how we look at it, like what sector makes sense and how, how can we, you know, invest in it, you know, in, if it makes sense. Yeah, but there's obviously a lot of other different ways. You know, there are someone who are like, just a trader, like they really look at it from a pure trading perspective and they are also very successful as well. So you need to kind of define how you want to do it. Yeah. So you look at first principles and you, you say DeFi, so decentralized finance and gaming are some of the most interesting use cases. Yeah. Use cases. But that's not enough. Then you need to have conviction and you have a limited amount of capital. Yes. And we actually talk about that. I was having a dinner with Alex Van Evy two years ago, I think. Probably near the top, around November or October 2021. And we were talking about Axie. I think he invested also earlier, yes. but like 3K or 5K. Yes. And then it became like a lot, like yes. millions. But then he told me, man, I was like, man, that's awesome. Like 5K into whatever, one, two, three mil, whatever. And he invested for some friends of his and they were like... But then he was looking at me and he was like, yeah. And I was like, what's going on, man? And he's telling me, I really admire people who have real conviction and then do a few very concentrated bets. And then he said, with Axie and actually a few other coins, there's only a few people who did that. The Delphi guys and you. Yes. It was like Arthur, like it's amazing, really well at that. And it's kind of counterintuitive because if you look at all the YouTube influencers, they're all like, invest 500 there, 500 bucks there, 500 bucks into like a thousand different coins or a hundred coins and you're going to become a millionaire. I mean, obviously, clickbait, clickbait, fine. But you need to diversify, right? But actually what we learn from traditional investing is billionaires concentrate, or millionaires diversify, billionaires concentrate, right? How much, so basically, and you've, you've done that, and yes. you've done that really well. How much do you still think this applies today? Or how much are you still following that kind of um, principle? Because then there's a problem, which is, when the fuck do you diversify? Because at some point you have to, right? Yes. And that's the mistake that we all do. Yes, yeah. That's, that's a very good question. I think that... Um, I, I think there's also a few caveat into it. Um, so... There's, there's a lot of survivorship bias uh, because the history are also full of people who actually concentrate and it did not work out well for them and they were just never mentioned again, right? Yeah. So I don't want to be uh, uh, blinded by the survivorship bias just because I managed to do it doesn't mean that it will always be better to concentrate. Uh, but I do think that uh, in crypto specifically, why it actually makes sense to be more concentrated, concentrated than over-diversifying is because if when you look at it, crypto as a whole trade at a very high correlation, the benefit you get from diversifying is not, not really there. Like the, if market crash, everything crash. If market go up, everything usually tend to go up a little bit more. Obviously, some go up more than others, some drop more than others. So as a, as a result, you don't really get the benefit of diversifying because in the traditional asset, the diversification makes sense because a lot of assets are like negatively correlated. So if this one go up, next one will go down. So you actually... You're, you're getting the benefit of diversification. But in crypto, that doesn't really make sense. So it is, it is um, likely better to be more concentrated but understand what you invest in a lot more. Because why this makes sense? Because if you do not understand what you're investing, it's a lot harder to weather the volatility in crypto because crypto have Absolutely. insane and extreme volatility. If you do not understand it, what if you drop 20%? You say, oh, I'm selling. 20%. Uh, is it the end? Yeah. Am I wrong? <laughs> because you don't understand enough, you're more likely to sell. But if you really understand, and I think it's not wrong to sell because it's a 20% drop, but you need to have, 
have a very strong and deep understanding so you know that what is your investment thesis and what is the trigger that will make you sell. It, it shouldn't be just because the price dropped 20%. But obviously, there's a signal for you to investigate further. But if there's no change in the fundamental, you shouldn't sell because it, there's a lot of cases where it's something we invest in, it dropped another 20 or 30% before it go up further. Yeah, so that, that are you able to weather this kind of volatility? But if you do not understand enough, it's a lot harder. So, which is why I think in crypto, it makes sense to be uh, concentrated because that means you're able to build a deeper understanding into what you're investing in. And if you invest, you're over-diversifying, it's a lot harder to catch up and really to understand what you're investing in, especially as a retail investor. So I'm your cousin, Kevin. I'm 20 years old, uh, 5K. How many coins do I invest in? Three, five, 10? Uh, how important is this 5K to you? If you lost all, if you lose all of it, are you going to be fine? Or is it going to be so important that you cannot afford no, it's this? not important. It's all my money, but I'm 20 years old okay. and I'm, I'm going to be able to work and okay. kind of make I, this I, I think in that sense, you should find a few projects or sector that excite you the most, that you really are intrinsically motivated to understand more and invest in those sectors and become a sector specialist. Because with that amount of money, you should become a specialist in this sector that you become like almost like a foremost expert. Because I think one thing people uh, ignore in crypto is like, uh, there's so much public information that if actually, if you even bother to spend the time to read up on it, you can become a, uh, like a certain subject matter expert in a few months. And actually you, you know more than some other full-time industry participants because they need to cover other things. And like people like me, right? I am running a business. There's so much management and operational stuff I need to do. I cannot just spend all my time looking, sitting in front of a computer, reading blog posts, reading research. And, but this is something a retail investor that only focus on a few projects or a few sectors can do better than me. So probably within three months, he will understand this project or this sector better than me because I cannot just only spend all my time looking at one project or one sector. But obviously, I try my best to and do that. And because it moves so fast too. Exactly. Yeah. So like, you know, if you're like a gamer, you think there's potential in Web3 gaming or crypto gaming, yeah, you should spend all your time in crypto gaming. You understand who are the top players, what are the things, and you become the subject matter expert. That is where you have your alpha because you understand this sector better than the rest of the market, probably better than 90% of the market. Yeah, probably, yeah. So I think this is where like a small, small balance and you become a subject matter expert. This is how you really make it, yeah. It's interesting because it's extremely similar to actually starting a company. Yes. Whatever the, or even picking up a job, right? But a company, most people say, ah, I want to start a company, but I don't know what. Probably the most, the first thing you want to do is look at what are you the most passionate about? <laughs> don't look at what you studied before. Just look at what you're the most passionate about because you, if you're passionate about it, you're going to spend hours, 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 and you, it's not even going to feel like work. And you will not only have fun doing it, but also you, because you're passionate about, you will be able to last yes. through all the shit that happens when you start a company, right? So it's very similar. So, so let's say I invested my 5K into like the next two industries that do amazingly well. What would, what would they be for you right now? What are the things you, you focus on the most? Um, for this upcoming bull run, Hope, hopefully upcoming bull run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we both uh, know it's coming, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for us, uh, obviously, we run a crypto investment fund, and we look at it from uh, you know we we consider a lot of things. And uh, right now, what we are excited the most is um, we think that crypto is um, uh, th there's like a like a like a, I like to, I hate to use this term too much paradigm shift uh i i think there's like a reshuffling of the industry after ftx and i think recently with the binance settlement as well it kind of put like some sort of closure into the that cycle of the of the of the of the industry um i think going forward the industry will have less cowboy i think the cowboyness and the wow wow west will never be gone but you get less and less it's just a sign of the industry maturing and I think what's going to happen is you will see more and more crypto exchange. They will go and get regulated, even though they're not regulated right now. They will want to find some, you know, countries like a good jurisdiction to get their crypto exchange license, whether it's Mika in Europe or even like US is a bit, you know, 
problematic, but you can get a money transmitter license and then you can run a crypto spot exchange. Uh, or in Singapore, you have the uh, Payment Services Act, you can get a you know pay- PSA license specifically to the digital payment token, which is crypto. Mm. <laughs> um, so for your information, Singapore have given out, I think 14 license to crypto exchange in Singapore so far. Uh, CoinHako, you know, and like um, Coinbase, all of them have gotten the license. And um, so more and more of these crypto exchange will be licensed. And I think that that's, but the problem is like, people still want to trade the crazy high risk stuff. But these regulated exchange, they cannot offer you the high risk stuff. I see. Not, at least not the first six months. I see where you're going. Not the first, not the first one year, right? So what happened? There's still this demand and you, you can never stop it because crypto is permissionless in this nature. And, so, people, and because people are gambling addicts who want to get rich overnight. I, I wouldn't want to go that far. <laughs> um, but, and, and, and this is, we are only talking about spot. What about derivative? Crypto derivative is the bigger market than spot. But I can tell you, there is no clear regulation for crypto derivative in any country right now. If you're in the US, by right, you need to be regulated by CFTC, Singapore, rest of the world, not sure. There is no clear, it depends on which lawyer you ask, they will give you a different answer. Uh, some say they should be regulated like any sort of normal derivative. Some sort of that, oh, crypto derivative is a bit different. Like probably it's different regulation. No, but no government has actually make a super clear guidance on how it should be regulated yet. So I think what happened is going to be, you're going to get a two extreme end on the market where institutional players, they're going to trade on regulated exchange like CME or the regulated exchange like Coinbase or this thing, but they cannot offer all the high risk things so quickly or even ever. You go to the decentralized exchange to trade all the high risk stuff, especially for derivative. Yeah. And all the, I would say, and also one of the biggest appeal is this is the biggest market opportunity. And what will happen in the next few years is a lot of the decentralized derivative trading platform, crypto derivative trading platform especially, they will offer revenue sharing. So in a way that you can become part of the owner of the protocol as well that facilitate crypto derivative trading. And this is a big market opportunity. And so this is where uh, we have one of the highest conviction. We think this sector will definitely become at least 10 times bigger from here. The question is who will be the winner? But uh, but it's also not an easy uh, sector to invest in because there's so many people have realized this right now. There's at least... 30 teams building a crypto derivative platform right now, whether it's on like Arbitrum or on like uh, whatever, Solana, like even Solana alone have three. I think going to have five soon. Mm. And like there's like DYDX, obviously we are a big investor of, we are lead investor of DYDX for the Series B. Uh, so there's so many. So, so obviously not, I'm, I can't say for sure who will be the winner. Obviously we have our own pick, but I, I believe this sector will grow at least 10 times from here in the next two to three years. So and gaming, which I mentioned, like yeah. if you're interested further, you can go and read the thesis we published two years ago. We think that it makes sense. Um, you know, th- I can spend like, at least 20 minutes on that. I don't want to go too much into the details, but I think that uh, among all the other consumer facing uh, sector that we have examined, gaming have the best fit with crypto. So far, it did not happen yet. I think actually you can say it's like a, it, it, it gives people some sort of imagination how it can be successful, but I think you can see an even more successful example than XC. It, can it be XC itself? Potentially, yes. If they can manage to re innovate again. Mm. Um, but it also can be other games that just, you know, break through imagination. And also, this also comes into the play where I'm also a huge, you know, uh, manga, anime fan, where you always see, you know, like there, there's some like a, a lot of like a, the, the setting is always like, you know, Ready Player One or like, you know, some like a Japanese manga where, you know, in 50 years later, there are some super successful gaming company, VR, everyone is just playing a game. Like probably half the world population is playing a game. It's a whole metaverse concept, right? Mm. Um, and I think that crypto is the platform to facilitate that to happen uh, because you is a coordination mechanism. It can permission, it can facilitate a permissionless exchange of digital assets. Um, but obviously this is, it, it, the timing of this is a bit hard to call. Yeah. So again, your little favorite little cousin, Kevin, with his 5K invests with a bit of luck and a lot of research yes. in the best perpetual decentralized exchange. Yes. And in the best, in the new Axie. 
Nice. Yes. 2.5K each. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Seed price because he got there before everyone. When should he sell or diversify? And here we're going to introduce, I mean, not directly, but basically what happened to you, but also what happened to me at a smaller scale and yes. to everyone else, right? Yes, yes. Because at the end of the day, it's great to be early. Yep. And finding the gems is not, is not easy, but we, we say we're, everybody's a genius in a beer market. <laughs> it's easy to make a lot of money. It's actually much easier than people think. If you have conviction, you go because a rising tide lifts Live all boats. boats yeah. yeah. But what's really hard for people in their first cycle, and that's what, you know, a bunch of people who've been through multiple cycles, they always say that. But when you're in your first cycle, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. They always say, what's hard is to keep your money, is not to make it, right? And you're like, yeah, 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 but um, I'm Kevin, right? I'm amazing. I'm 20 years old. Yeah. So what, uh, when do you sell or when do you diversify? What would you tell your younger cousin? Yeah. So there's two parts to it. First is from a pure investment perspective. Uh, at what valuation, at what price, this is fairly value or overvalued. So this is something that every different project you should, I mean, you, it's like you can generalize it to a certain extent, but I think right now in crypto, we don't have a very standardized valuation methodology to value it. So there's a bit of art to this, and this is why we are managing a fund because we think we can value crypto better than the mm. rest of the market. Um, you need to determine at what price or valuation this project or crypto is overvalued or fairly valued. And this is where you start thinking about exit. How do you determine that? There's different way of doing it. You can, some people like to look at it from a market cycle perspective. Some people like to do it on a relative comparable perspective, on an absolute DCF cash flow perspective. There's no right or wrong, uh, but you need to have a methodology to determine. And this should be adjusted to the fundamental as well. Because sometimes if the fundamental is doing so well, you should actually not sell from a pure investment perspective. It's like uh, a good example. Warren Buffett, he bought Apple, I think in 2018, 19, when it's already, uh, I think 100 plus to 200 billion market cap. Yeah. But it went out to do another 5 to 10x from there. <laughs> Even though the Apple back then is already the top yeah. five biggest company in the US, in the world. So like, a lot of people question, a lot of people back then question Warren Buffett said, oh, they lost their touch, you know, they bought Apple too late, you know, they're already 100 plus billion. But I think what happened is Apple's fundamental continue to keep up and keep up with the valuation. They continue to sell more and more iPhone and MacBook. Uh, it's getting more and more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so the market cap become almost 2 trillion or 2 trillion right now, mm -hmm. I think. So he, Warren Buffett made a 10x from an investment, even though it's already a two billion, 200 billion market company. Um, so there's, there's, so the, you need obviously also need to adjust your valuation based on the fundamental of the company of, of the project as well. So this is something that's obviously there's more like an industry kind of expertise come in as well. Um, but then another another aspect of this is your personal financial situation. Um, at what point you should not be so concentrated because five k like what we say right, Kevin twenty years old, he can lose five k. Yeah, and obviously he's young, he can make back all the money. But you should also look at it. And, if you lose that amount of money, how hard or how easy is it for you to make back the money? So for crypto, like I said, we run a fund, right? So we are, our strategy, we, are, we can take a bit more volatility because we know that our strategy uh, is, is, is usually like a more skewed toward like a high volatility. And obviously we don't aim for high volatility. We aim for higher return, which means that we invest in the younger stage project. So we don't really invest in Bitcoin, Ethereum because those are what we call the market beta. Mm -hmm. We want to get the alpha. And alpha, so usually we invest in a younger crypto protocol, like a, you know, few hundred million market cap or even like a low billions market cap, not, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, but this naturally is more volatile. But we know that because we, we think that, uh, you know, we believe that we have a good uh, investment process skill set. So even though we are wrong on something, you are down 30, 40%, our other investment will make up for the losses you know, because they'll go out 100%, so they'll cover the 20% loss we have on this one. Um, it's the same for like this, um, you know, Kevin, can he afford to lose 1 million? If he think he's so good that if he lose 1 million, it's not that difficult for him to make back the 1 million in one year, then mm. 
probably he should not overly early exit if he still think this have a lot of upside. But if for his personal finance, he think that, oh, he cannot take this risk, he just do not have the mental fortitude to take like a 100k, 200k swing uh, in a, his personal net worth, then he should probably start diversifying from there. And I think this is the part where it's really about personal preference because everyone have a different risk tolerance. But I think that it's important to set aside the market condition, don't care about the bull market or bear market, to ask yourself, what is your risk tolerance? Because the problem is like, bull market amplify your risk tolerance. Absolutely. Yeah, you think that, oh, you can actually take that risk. But when the market turns, you realize that, oh, I actually, I'm not able to take that much risk. So it's better to just, okay, assuming that you set aside the bull bear market, remove the market assessment, ask yourself how much risk you are willing and are able to take. That is the level you start de-risking. And obviously I have some crazy friends. I also consider myself having, having a fairly high risk tolerance. I'm willing to take profit way higher because I, I just have that risk tolerance. Right? But some people, a lot of people do not have that risk tolerance and do not want to take that amount of risk. They can and it's okay to de-risk earlier. Yeah. Which makes a lot of sense, especially, but it's difficult the first cycle because you, I mean, we all get greedy, obviously. And you know, like you realize, ah, 5K, now I have 100K. Ah, but maybe I could have 500. Then you have 500. I could have a million. If you sell, you're never going to have the million or the 500 or the 5 million, right? But if you don't sell, at some point, it's going to turn against you. So what's probably important like to understand is that there is, there is cycles. Maybe they change a bit, maybe, but like there is cycles and there's, there's probably going to be more cycles in the future. And based on that, it's more like seeing your, something I'm applying for myself, like your financial goals as a sort of a stairs where you're like, okay, this was my, you set your target in the beginning of the bull market and you make a few assumptions and you're, this is, this is like achievable, you know, Yep. With, without just pray, praying. Yep. And when I'm there. I should really, I mean, it's very difficult and probably you need to get burnt a few times to really uh, do that. Yes. Right. But I sell and then I'm on my first stair and then there's another cycle. And instead of in one year, I'll get to this bigger target in five without killing my mental health too much in the middle. And also something important is to understand that once you reach your goal, like you're not a different person and you still want to, maybe you're going to go travel for six months, but like uh, there's no such thing as retirement, like for young people, especially yes. the ones who are in this industry who are very entrepreneurial. Yes. If anything, the retirement kind of like makes you bored or depressed. So like you might as well take a bit more time. I, actually, Jordi, he was saying on the podcast, Jordi Alexander, he was saying he has this framework where he thinks, he was talking about Do Kun yes. and Kylan Su and he was saying, I think it's good to make money, but you should not make too much money too quickly because otherwise you always want more and you end up taking so much risk yes. that you blow up. Yes. Basically. So good one. How important is money to you? We talked a bit about that before about your childhood, but now that you're doing amazing, did it change something? Do you realize oh, it's actually not as important as I thought? Or actually you say, oh no, actually I love that, you know? I couldn't, couldn't live without what I have now. <laughs> like for me, it's more like the, mat the level of maturity that comes through growing money so quickly, but also losing a lot, right? Yes. And when you lose it, you actually start to get more perspectives. Yes, uh, I think it will always be quite important to me um, because I think it's a matter of like, um, being able to take care of yourself, uh, I, I think having money, me, if, you, if you cannot even, obviously there's a lot of, you know, objective circumstances that might make it challenging. You know, not everyone have the same circumstances and conditions, but for me personally, if I'm not even be able to sort out my finance, that means I'm not taking a good care of myself. Like I, I basically lose control of my life if I'm not even able to be sort out my finance. So that is to me personally, how is it? How is it? So, you know, having money is important because that means that I'm actually having my life under control. Yeah. You bought a Lambo, 2021. <laughs> if I remember well, it was kind of like the kind of 
top of the DeFi coins, right? Yeah. Ish, kind of mark the top. Why I did you buy a Lombo? Earlier, so. Okay, okay. Why did you buy a Lombo? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, uh, I I think it's this kind of like uh, I don't have other big purchases. Um, and I never owned a car until then. And I think that it's just a first car. Yeah, first car. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I I think it's just a way of you know, some something material to kind of uh. Uh, serving as a memorial <laughs> to yep. the achievement. Yep. Yeah. Like it, it's. I mean, it's obviously quite cliche. You you could have got other more tasteful things, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But sometimes it is. Uh, it is good looking. Uh, <laughs> I saw uh, it just uh, two days ago. It's very it is, good looking. <laughs> so it's a good commemorative stuff to remind you of your achievement. Yes. It's interesting. Well, and it's something personal, yeah. Too. So I, I, I don't really. I, I actually regretted sharing it. Uh, I, I sh- in hindsight, I shouldn't have do it. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting because I have two previous guests on this podcast, who, one he bought a Lambo when he was twenty seven, and he told me, man, it was so stupid. I should never have done that. Very humble dude and doesn't really care about anything materialistic. Then I had another one, founder of uh, Black Paris, which is a luxury fashion brand. Yep. He started to make money really early on, 21, 22. He bought a, like a really nice Porsche when he was 22. And I asked the same question. And he was like, man, it made me so happy. And even now, I'm so fucking happy when I, <laughs> when I go into my Lambo or my Ferrari. Like, I love it. And he's just honest about it, right? So I don't think it's a bad thing. It's more like to see there is different people who think different things. And uh, I think that's the most interesting, right? Yeah, this guy is a certified petrol head. <laughs> <laughs> So it's Q1, 2022. We are all drinking the crypto cool aid. We're yes. all the kings of the world. You are literally King Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but at some point, like the music stops, right? Yes. Because it always will. For me, it was uh, Luna. Like watching millions of dollars melt into $5 in, I think, two days or three yes. days. When did things start to smell bad for you? Um, you mean our outlook on the market or like, you know, what happened? Everything that happened, like basically you're, you, you know, like there's this moment where everybody is like, I mean, shit posting on Twitter, king of the word in life. Like it's amazing. The moment you're like, and usually it's a, it's kind of overnight. It's not like, oh, things start to like be less good. It's really like there's a big event and you're like, fuck man. Like I, I, I think for us, we actually managed the market downturn. Better than the most. Uh, in that sense, we actually, in March, we kind of getting a bit more concerned about the macro risk uh, because, you know, uh, inflation is picking up. F- f- is the high probability Fed, Federal Reserve will increase the interest rate. Yeah. So we already started de-risking in March. Uh, so in that sense, we, 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 we are not super impacted by the market downturn, but have definitely price has been dropping. Every month, our fund return is negative. Um, but what, the, what started the whole, you know, turned out like you, you realize the industry is really not in a good shape is obviously Luna as well. Luna collapsed in May and that was the first domino to fall, right? Like uh, we, we already were, okay, so we obviously we invested in Luna uh, and... Defiance also invested in Luna. Yeah, we we did invest in Luna. Um, but we obviously uh, cons- So our our vision. I, okay, I think you obviously a lot of wrong things happen. Uh, I mean, obviously a lot of the things should not have been done. But there was a hope of you know being. Why why we invest is because we think that Luna has grown so fast. Uh, and obviously you if you do a pure algorithmic stable coin is very risky because there's no intrinsic asset backing it. So the race was actually to buy Bitcoin to collateralize Luna, obviously on yep. a partial level. Yep. Why we invest is actually we think that they actually have a chance of turning Luna into a more sustainable model. So we want to help Luna to become more sustainable because at least it's partially backed, not 100%, but it's backed by the Bitcoin. So all the money by right, and I, which I think it did went to acquire Bitcoin and actually it did push out the Bitcoin price a little bit, I think back then. Mm. 
Um, but unfortunately, the anchor grow too fast. You know, the whole unsustainable bubble burst. And you know, there's a deep pack, and obviously the mechanism, the worst scenario of the lunar mechanism happen, and hyperinflation and mm. go to zero. And obviously, then um, you start seeing uh, the industry stress start coming. So we our fund was down, uh, obviously because we invest in lunar, but it's it's a calculated risk we took. So we actually are okay. Like it, the hit to our fund is not that big. So in that moment, you say, okay, it's bad. But it's not that bad. We are yes. actually doing pretty well. We are doing okay. Like yeah. we are with, because yeah. it's a calculated risk we yeah. took. And yeah. so even we lose money on it, we lost money on it, is something that we prepare. Yeah. Obviously, we don't want it to happen, but we are prepared for it. But what really get really bad for us is, is during June, when uh unfortunately there's another crypto company that collapsed and dragged me and our company into the whole situation which is a very challenging situation. It's super difficult to resolve. And yeah, I would say June is where shit hits the fan. And it's like probably like the worst uh, moment I ever experienced in my life. Yep. Do you want to elaborate more a bit on that? I think without going into the details, it's just really um, a few things. Uh, one, misplaced trust. Uh, like you trust the wrong person, which is I would say uh quite common when in the business world like you know in failure like i mean when it comes to the startup world the number one reason that startup fail is always co-founder dispute absolutely number one reason and it's completely and it's documented a lot but it's under talked about i yep. think i read yesterday it's 80 percent. maybe it might be a bit less but like yes. people underestimate so much how much co-founder issues kill businesses exactly but for us it's not really a, a like, co-founder dispute it's in a sense, a misplaced trust uh, without going into the details. Second, uh, is obviously like the the defer to authority and subject expert because we trusted someone who they claim they know what they are doing. And as a result, we thought that they know what they are doing. But turned out it was a lie and it was a, it's, it's, a, it's false. They uh, actually have no, no idea what they are doing. They took an insane amount of risk, dragged down the industry, and also, you know, impacted us in the process. Yeah. Um, and obviously that 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 realization all come at the same time and it hit you very hard because it's something that it's basically that can you imagine that if you hypothetically um should I should I should I use an example using like a Singapore context or a global context? Maybe more global. Okay. Hypothetically, um Elon Musk do business like imagine Elon Musk is your business partner in some way like it's probably not co-founder but in some way you your business have something to do with Elon Musk yep. and he's the one that asks you hey you should come and do this with me I use my resource to help you you can tap on my resource and it's like a strategic partnership and Elon Musk go into bankruptcy he drag you down with it that is kind of what happened and it's something you never imagine happen because you think oh Elon Musk is so successful yep. he know what he's doing he's the richest man in the world he know his shit and turn out that shit, he, he's gambling. He's also taking all this kind of crazy risks and he has no risk management. He's extremely poor operator and executive. That is what happened to me. Yeah. That's an interesting one because we talk about, we talked about that the other day, which is the fact that followers or influence or the, the illusion of authority, basically, it's yes. kind of like the, the, the right wording, is we think for some reason you have these personas and in crypto, they kind of like come and go faster yes. because in crypto, everything happens faster. But it's also in, no, in normal world, these people that we see as hyper successful and we think these guys, they really build different, right? Yes. Even, even I remember... Um, Kyle tweeting, like you're kind of like when when uh, Coinbase went did an IPO, basically you're saying this is bearish uh, Bitcoin bullish ETH or whatever, and it turned out well. And then he was like, just saying like built different. So you're like these dudes, or you know SBF, how the fuck do you come out of the blue and build like a thirty billion company and become multi billionaire overnight? Yes, at thirty years old. Yes you must be built different. Like it's not possible otherwise. Yes. Right. And we all kind of fall kind of victim of that. Yes. And then you have the followers and then you have these guys who are online and kind of like 
I mean, obviously, we're kind of like admiring them one way or another. Yes. And the problem with that is first that, I mean, as you said the other, the other day, it's often they don't know what they're doing, but they just took much more risks kind of at the right time or did some illegal stuff, but we don't know yet it's kind of illegal, yes. right? Yes. And the problem with that is we make our decisions, becoming a business partner or continuing in the market or taking more risk based on what these people tweet or post or talk about. Yes. Because we're like, they're so successful that I need to listen to them. Otherwise, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the idiot who is uh, uh, making only 10 million and not uh, 3 billion, right? Or yes. whatever. Like, even when you are doing really well already and you are, you end up, I mean, I, for me, there was this tweet and some people talked about it from Sue. Suzu who was saying uh, 50 million is not going to, because there was all the inflation thing, right? Also 50 million today. I mean, there's this thing on Twitter. Uh, is 1 million a lot of money? Is 10 million a lot of money in the bull market, right? 50 million will not buy you a reasonably sized house. I remember reading that. And I was thinking, man, like, I'm really doing complete shit here when I was doing absolutely amazing. And also other people who I knew, I was, based on what they were saying, I was kind of overestimating what they're doing, actually. Yes. So you always think other people are doing better. Oh, for some reason. Yes. Like, oh, doing better. So absolutely. I, and so you always think they're, they're doing better or they just, just lie. Yes. It's not their money. They're taking their loans to do that or they're just posting fake PLs yes. or fake letters or whatever. Like, yes. So you end up making decisions when you were basically doing amazingly well on your own with your own judgment. Yes. That are completely wrong based on, the, some, on what someone else says that is co a complete lie. Yes. And then you screw yourself in the foot. What a waste, basically. Yes. What a complete waste of energy, mental health, resource, everything, right? Yes. And that's the thing that doesn't make any sense. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so how much... Are you, are you kind of, I mean, obviously you partner with like the kind of wrong people, but how much were you also kind of prey towards that, to, to, to that kind of people just saying these things because we're all in the same industry and it, we all, they always say, we're all going to make it, right? Yes. We're all making, f f yeah. um, if your lads don't make money with you, it's not fun. But that's not fucking true. Most people, they're competitive as fuck and they're like, I'm very happy that you're doing well, but as long as I do better than you, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. What do you think about all this stuff? I, I think that, um, which is why I say like, I am a cynical optimist right now. And this is the part of the crypto world you need to be cynical about, mm. right? There's a lot of people who are LARPing, making misleading claims. LARPing. Lying <laughs> uh, publicly. And this is something that you learn it when you have spent enough time in the crypto space. And yeah, like I, I think that this is a, a very unfortunate um, situation where it is amplified by social media uh, and crypto, you know, combining the degeneracy and uh, fast paced volatility of crypto and social media, it bring out the most extreme kind of like, uh, behavior and, 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 and kind of like a, uh, posturing that and i think that's like uh, it's basically you, you you put the worst form of dynamite together right it, it created a, like a worst kind of chemicals together it created like a nuclear bomb i think that's what happened like like you you have the degeneracy of crypto the potential for making a huge amount of money in crypto potential and with the power of social media and amplifying certain messages it creates such a powerful uh message whether it's right or wrong, uh, yeah. it's like it, some a lot of times it's wrong, but it become a super powerful message, and so that that also what makes cryptos always as a center of attention, right? Sometimes for the bad news or the good news, or some recently mostly for the bad news, yeah, because it just catch you, catch so much attention, and I think this is part that where yeah, like uh, some some you have to learn it by experience and to to discern the facts and the signal and the noise. Uh, and obviously, I think this is like a, the common trap in crypto that which I think um, 
it's easy to fall into. Uh, so I, I think that this is something I also have reflected on myself as well. So usually right now, like it, some from time to time, sometimes you still want to shit post a bit. Um, but you you do have certain yeah. line you need to draw where you you do not want to encourage something that is too, uh, um, you know, irresponsible and reckless. And I think this is something that every influential figure in crypto should should think about it when they say something or whatever it, it, it can bring some unintended consequences so it's really about like a, how, how can the industry itself just kind of collectively uh, hold ourselves to a higher standard yeah and be, beyond that do you really want government to regulate your speeches <laughs> or your actions you do not want that right so uh, this is a very tricky issue and yes it is present in crypto and it's very hard to resolve and it's all is all basically everything comes back to ego yeah and the ego of people and with Jordi we're talking about ego and how basically it's the single biggest barrier to your success I actually went before this because this this podcast looking at some ego quotes like and I found two that are really cool one is by Toba Beta if you think you're smart things to think twice to be smarter like a good reminder when like things go really up crazy, hopefully in a year or two, and you think you're too smart and you're better than anyone else and think twice to be smarter. Yep. And the other one is by Deepak Chopra. The ego, however, is not who you really are. The ego is your self image. It is your social mask. It is the role you are playing. Your social mask thrives on approval. It wants control and it is sustained by power because it lives in fear. And so, yeah, probably a great reminder for each, each and every one of us yes. that when things go really too well, back to your cynical optimism, always be cynical. Yep. And even if you're the party pooper of the, of the crew at the party. Yeah. Yeah. But it is hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you are a VC, it's even harder. Why? Because, uh, so VC, which means venture capitalists, um, you know, most, uh, they are people who invest in startups. Yeah. And the whole culture and social dynamic of VC encourage them to sort of play a long game. They need to be well liked, uh, very connected. So you founders, good founders will want you to invest in them. And you also will share the bit like the, the other VC will share their good deal flows with you. So this is how the VC world work, where it's like a it's a very clubby, chummy like the kind of like a industry where everyone kind of know each other. And you, he, there's a lot of collaboration. There's there's a good and bad thing. And the good thing is like this industry, like the VC space, is really about collaboration because a lot of time, I mean, okay, it's, sometimes it is different, but a lot of time, uh, you have a few VC invest together in uh, a startup. And so you want to know the other VC, right? So that, you know, you know who you can trust, what other good VC you want to work together to invest in some things. And also there's some like an information sharing like that you can reference with each other. What do you think about founder A? What do you think about founder B? So like also industry knowledge sharing, all this thing. Uh, but the, the, the kind of, the, the dynamic play out in, sometimes in a, in a bad way, which everyone want to be friendly in each other. Nobody want to say the bad thing to be the party pooper because if you put the part you become the party pooper, you're not going to be invited to the next party. And that is a career risk because what if there's a huge successful next startup raising and because you're the party pooper, people don't like you and they do not want to invite you to the next investing to the this startup anymore. And then you, it's very dangerous to you from a career perspective. I actually hear the, I mean, it's more crypto related, but about the Luna case again, that there were a few key people in the industry who thought it was never going to work but could not just share it publicly because exactly of that. Yes. Can you elaborate more on the VC game and more on the kind of VC herd and formal behavior? And I want to introduce this part by something I read yesterday uh, on Twitter by a, a dude called CL on crypto Twitter. I mean, it's not linked to VCs exactly, but it's, I mean, a bit to like a, a, a project that is kind of, kind of blowing up now, but he wrote, sell me this pen. Did, did you read it? 
a pen backed by Paradigm. Yeah. And I was laughing so hard and I was like, man, I need to use that to basically introduce the kind of VC FOMO and uh, the dynamic that it creates yes. in the VC world. And obviously the bigger picture here is how can we, for example, if we look at FTX, because it's all linked, how can a business like FTX have received that much money in funding when it should never have because, you know, compliance, accounting, nothing was there, right? Yes. How is that even possible? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, so, so, like I mentioned just now, uh, the VC, they don't want to be a party pooper because what they did, that create a risk where they will not be invited to invest in a great startup this is just on the VC side, but also on the founder side, because if you develop a reputation as being a tough guy in the industry, other founders, new founders, they have never worked with you before, they might heard this rumor. And the thing is like, rumors spread, right? And yeah. most of the time, rumors are not accurate. Like there's some extra sauce thrown into it. So what if this rumor get out that you are a tough guy, you are like a mean guy to work with, you know, you, you want to insist on bad terms for the founders. If this rumor spread, all the new founder, they never vote with you, they never heard of you, but because of this rumor, they do not want to take your investment anymore. So that creates a risk where generally, most VC do not want to be perceived as uh, hostile to founders and being tough to work with or being a bad guy. And that kind of dynamic makes VC just generally do not want to call the bad stuff because if you're called the best stuff, sometimes you're attacking other people's portfolio. Yeah. You're affecting their financial outcome and people will want to protect that. Uh, like this in crypto lingo, we call it protect our backs. Yeah. So, <laughs> and crypto is just so inherently tribal, right? You're some, and sometimes you're not even attacked by the other industry participants. You're an, attacked by all the anon, anonymous, especially, you know, for some crypto project, they have a very devoted, almost to a cult level community where if you even say something bad, they will all come and spam your account and just attack you relentlessly and you become their so-called bad VC. And again, this rumor can spread. And so a lot of time for VC, it's just easier not to deal with this um, headache. And also from a, a, it's also very little upside. Like look at it from as a VC perspective. If you call out the bullshit, what do you get in return? Yeah. You get a bit of like a social cloud if you're right. But what if you're wrong? Yeah. If you're wrong, yeah. people say you... <laughs> You just, yeah, this guy is just like a, what we call fudster or like just you know, a, a boy crying wolf like you know he's just bullshitting even you're right you do not gain anything you're not rewarded like you probably are people remind were reminded oh you you call some scam but when when the scam have happened there's damage nobody will go and thank oh thank you for calling out this guy I mean you yes you, you, you will have some people to thank you but people who lost money will not even care because they already lost the money yeah. you're not the hero to them although you did warn them about this before um, or they will see you as the guy who started all the fun that <laughs> the <laughs> that project. That's right? Yeah. So th there's just no very little upside <laughs> for VCs to call out the, the wrongdoings. And as a result, this industry becomes a situation where a lot of the influencer people, they all want deal flow as well. This, this industry has become like, oh, everyone wants to get into the next sexy deal. Especially if the lead investor is Paradigm or X, X, and Z. The more you want to get in, because these two are perceived to be the top crypto VC in the space. If two of them are leading some project, you want to at least get the deal flow. If you keep shit talking paradigm portfolio, they will not want you to invest in their subsequent deal yeah. anymore. So what happened? So this create a dynamic where VCs, investor generally, they do not want to call the bullshit because there's no upside to them. There's only downside. And obviously this this also tie into the issue where I talk about where very little are incentivized to call the scams. And so the scam can grow very fast because people who disagree do not want to call out because they it gain them nothing. And people who promote it, even though it's turned out to be wrong and cause a huge damage in, in, the, in the end, they still benefit a lot from promoting it, whatever. So the whole incentive is not aligned. But do you see a case where, it's kind of extreme, but it might even happen when things go crazy, where a VC that doesn't like a project ends up kind of having to invest because they're formally. Because there is external forces. Yes. Yes. Um, so the foremoing part is also um, very prevalent. I think it's also because where VC is a power law business. Um, uh, so I, 
I'm not a baseball guy, but I think there's a one very famous uh, venture capitalist called Bill Gurley. He, 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 he has a phrase. Venture capitalist business is not just a home run business. It's like a grand slam business, something like that. It's mm-hmm. like a, you, 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 you basically want to get a thousand X. You don't want to get like a few 20X. Yeah. You want to make sure there's one investment that just thousand X and just return the entire fund. Yeah. So the, as, a, as a result of this, the cost of missing out one big home run is bigger than you invest in a few scams and yeah. go to zero. Yeah. Because as long as that home run cover all your scams, you make money. And, and that is actually right. From a VC math perspective, this is actually what happened. Like your home run actually can cover a lot of your zero. Uh, even though they, they might not be scammed, they can just, just be a wrong investment. But as long as one of them turn out to be right, it will cover all your other investment. Um, so as a result, when you see some some good deal, like you don't want to miss out on the next Facebook, you don't want to miss out on the next Apple, Google, right? If you miss out, the career risk is that, like, oh, you saw the deal, you didn't invest. You're not a good VC. So as a result, the VC have this FOMO because they're worried that they might miss out on the next big unicorn, next big thing. So that, that kind of FOMO creates pressure that they they also don't want to be too founder unfriendly because if they, they insist on too many terms, okay, let's say for FTX, right, without naming the investors, the dynamic is even though these investors are all very reputable top VC in the world, not just in crypto, they also f- feel the same kind of social dynamic. If they're being a tough guy, they ask too much question, SBF back then was like the golden Absolutely. Boy of crypto. Absolutely. Right. Forbes, he do all this media game. He hang out with all this like a celebrity or whatever. Even though you are like some very successful VC, he was like, oh, you don't take my money? Fine. Who are you? I have another VC. They will, they will take your space. And they were like, oh shit. If I negotiate too much, <laughs> SBF don't want to take my money. He will take my competitor's money. Then I'm fucked. Right. So this dynamic creates a situation. Oh, oh, I don't want to be too tough. You know, yeah, you have no board of director. That's probably fine. You, we can do it when you get listed. Uh, <laughs> and you know, your accounting or your, you, you give us some number. It looks okay. Then we, we don't ask you too much questions. I think they do. I, I think they did a committed due diligence. Um, but how deep and how much grilling they do is something that we do not know. Because they, they, the, the, if you grill too much, the founders start offended they say, oh you are you questioning my integrity that means we cannot work together because you do not trust me boom so that would mean that even a temasek who is one of the you know big investors and who is supposed to have done like the biggest due diligence six months or nine months i mean they get subject to the same dynamics yes. and yes the due deal might have like lasted six months but I, they might have they might have we have no idea this conversation where Okay, give me a few numbers, like is enough. Like this is possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like they can probably give you a statement, say, oh, um, uh, we, this is a pro forma statement. Where uh like probably there, there is and they say, oh, our audit is delayed. But we need to close around next month or next week. So yeah. just take our pro forma financial statement. Yeah. And our audit is delayed. And so and so they probably have an audit report for 2020, 2020, but 2021 is delayed. Yeah. So are you gonna s- delay the deal? Because <laughs> I love of this? the little smile when you say it. <laughs> yeah. So this is, that's a kind of social. I know. I'm. I'm not saying it happened in FTX. No, no, case. I'm saying no, that no. this is what can happen no, no, that yeah. during the due diligence process, where you you don't push too hard on some of the things that if you push too hard, you might perceive to be a very tough guy. That you know you are just you are just trying to create mess out of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most of the time, it is true that you are actually trying to create mess because. The, the whole thing about venture capitalist business is, and it's not wrong, right? Even in the business world, that you do not assume people are going to commit fraud because it's every single transaction in the business world is on the notion that this guy might commit fraud on me, the whole trust breaks down no. and the world becomes super hard Done. to yeah. operate. Like you cannot do any business on the assumption that people are going to commit fraud on me. So here we talked about VC, basically a frothy environment, bull market, VC FOMO, right? Yeah. Now, now I want to go one step further and introduce other stakeholders, which is the companies that the VCs invest in and us, the retail people, right? Yes. And how, you know, the VC, okay, there, there's kind of like some fault there, fine, but like everyone is at fault, right? Why? Let's look, let's look at the lenders, for example, right? Because everything blew up because of lending. And 
I was uh, f two, three weeks back, I was in Dubai to do a uh, podcast with the co-founder of Swissborg. And I was like, how are you still alive? You didn't lend me. And he told me. And he's the guy, he's uh, called Anthony, he's the guy who's doing the risk management and who made the decision to not increase rates. When everybody was increasing the lending rates, <laughs> he was like, no. The only reason he was saying, I'm not a genius. We all knew these kind of rates were unsustainable, but we don't have any VC investors. So we watched people come, our lending product go from zero to 1.5 billion very quickly. And then competitors, you know, Celsius increasing yep. rates. And then we watch the 1.5 billion melting into 300 million. And then internally we have these kind of fights and arguments, but like he's telling me I'm like there and I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Yep. But so they don't do it, but they feel the pain, right? Yep. Because they're like, fuck man. Like, because the, the competitors are doing it. The yeah. competitors are doing it. And the retailers, like the, they go the with the higher rates. We're yeah. like, we're just leaving. Like we, there is zero loyalty. Like, yes, oh yeah, course. I'm a community member. I love the talk. This is all bullshit. Like, I mean, not all, but a big chunk of yes. it is, right? Let's be honest. Token is good to bootstrap your business, everything. Community is a great concept, but like in those moments, you see the concept of actual community, right? Yeah. So he's saying the only reason we're still uh, alive is because we made a decision to not increase rates because it didn't make sense, but we could not have made this decision had we had, we had VC investors who were pushing like crazy hey, I invested in you. I'm not going to give you more money if you don't increase like your competitors. So we end up in this environment where everybody, not only the VCs, but the company founders, even if they know it's wrong, they have to think short, short term yep. for competition. And all the retail people who want to make, if you think about it, you know, like it's basically zero sum versus positive sum game. Yes. Like I should make the long-term decisions for the industry, because if I don't, probably I'm gonna get fucked somewhere as a retail invest in investor. Yep. So everyone is basically doing the wrong thing at the same time. So you have yes. all these dynamics that are happening and um, it's kind of crazy. And then it can, if you think about it, I mean, we're always smarter afterwards, obviously, but it can only end up bad. Yep. And if you think about it, it's probably what happens every cycle because every cycle is a bubble and every bubble is fueled by debt and leverage one way or another. Yes. And short-term thinking yes. and thinking I can get money before the other and get out and all that. And it just repeating. Yep. Let's yeah. talk about something more positive. <laughs> yeah. The comeback story. Yeah, sure. Yeah. How much did this last 18 months impact your mental health? Uh, a decent amount. Um, I do not have any mental issue. Uh, I do think that uh, I have a better mental fortitude than most people. Uh, it is challenging. I, I do lo lose some sleep over the past 18 months, but I'm still uh, able to function normally. And I, I, yeah, I, I'm still able to persist. How do you get back on your feet after a crazy journey in both sense, you know, like first, like things go up like crazy. It's affecting everything, your dopamine, probably your anxiety. We all say that our mental health is almost worse in a bull market than in a bear market. So, but you go through these crazy emotions and money swings. How do you get back on your feet after like such catastrophes that happened to you, but that happened to a lot of people in the space, almost everyone got yes. burned one way or another. Like, how do you go to the most basic level? And there's not going to be any magic here, but get back on your feet to, to, to come back. I think uh, th there's no one size fit all answer, but for me, it's really to do it one step at a time. I think that you, you obviously realize the magnitude of the problem where your entire business is... Uh, is the, the entire existence is at questions, uh, but you 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 need to you realize the magnitude of the problem, but you try to break it down into how you can resolve the process step by step, mm. and also different piece of issue. So so it doesn't overwhelm you. So I think that is what I did, uh, which I break down the issue to different part and see what I can do to solve it. And obviously, you cannot 
solve all the issue because, you know, shit happens. And you try to, you know, seek the best way out of it. Obviously, it is painful, but I think that if you do it one step at a time, it is manageable. Like, you obviously don't try to solve all the problem at the same time. You focus on what you can, like, solve the most at the beginning, which for me, which is like to, to see how much of my team I can keep, you know, how can I, how can we find, how can we, you know, make the business, how can we restart the business in some way until we resolve the existing issue? And also, how do you ex- resolve the existing issue? Obviously, both happen in parallel, but it it doesn't, you know, there is always that one small piece that you do it one step, step by step, step by step, step by step. And as I was going through the process, um, you don't overthink too much. I mean, sometimes it does, but everyone have a different way of distracting themselves for me, you know, sometimes play some games, you know, exercise and all this kind of different things. Um, but if you do it once at a time, you you just flow through it. Uh, and I think that, you know, you you look look back into it one year later, you actually do not know how the time has passed. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you just keep going through the motion and you just keep doing it. And just do not overcomplicate, um, not, uh, kind of, do not uh, overthink somewhere you is out of your control I would say that is the best thing but that doesn't mean you should live in a denial so again that mm. like the, the whole nuances is very important because I think there is a difference where people just completely give up and say fuck it I can't do any shit this, this is over I, I I can't do anything anymore so I, I didn't do that so for me it's like shit hits the fans it's a big problem but that doesn't mean I should give up there is still some way I can create the best situation out of it. I should not completely just give on it. But I think that's, that's probably the biggest difference between what I've done compared to what a lot of other people in the industry have done. They just completely say, oh shit, it's over. I mm. I, I don't care anymore. I'll just completely give it up. I run away. Um, that's, that's what most normies do actually. Yeah, like, but this, I, I didn't do this. So for me, it's like, although like, the problem is huge, I commit to resolve it. Go through the motion, get the best out of it uh, and you might not receive a lot of praise whatever you, you continue to fa- face a lot of challenge criticism you know people say oh you you fucked up and whatever but it doesn't really matter if, because if it's, it's, it's to yourself like do you want to solve this issue or you just want to leave yourself in regret that said you, you messed up the whole thing you actually didn't even bother to try to solve and fix the problem so for me at least I think I'm very committed to resolving the issue in, in, in a real sense not just talk like I actually put committed the action to it um and then if you do that you 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 commit to yourself you're gonna fix the issue and that thing does like if, if you give it your best even though the outcome might not be what you wanted uh you i think i think you you can uh, be at peace with yourself and i think this is what happened like, i am at peace with myself because i really know i done the best i you know i that is what i i, I done my best and this is what i i had try my best to solve the situation without screwing up anyone yeah and the, I say almost the beauty of like this industry, despite all the bad shit that happens all the time, is there is always another shot. And if you've done it once, there's zero reason you can't do it another time, especially given all the experience you've you've gained from all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like actually, one of my investors say that, you know, say it's sorry to say that, but you know, what happened to you actually made you a business better entrepreneur, a better fund manager, because that means you're not going to repeat the same mistake again. And he's glad that I'm not learning that on his time. (laughs) Yeah. How did what happened change your perspective on life and trusting other people who are close to you? I I think the biggest change uh, is uh, like I mentioned, like becoming a lot more cynical and skeptical. Uh, especially on the authority part, like, you know, just because someone is successful, smart, well-spoken, dressed well, in a high position of power, doesn't mean you should trust them 100%. Doesn't matter who they are. Uh, And that is like something I experienced in person, real life. So, you know, a lot of things, you are just going to come to your own conclusion. So it really encouraged me to do independent research and a lot of things and obviously that doesn't make the world easier place to, place to navigate right and I think that we all would hope that we are living in a world where there's a lot of things you can really trust the expert and defer to the authority but it's just an unfortunate reality where it's not the case where mm. you just need to build your own framework on evaluating different things 
uh, especially the more complicated and the higher consequences and impact of this decision, the more you need to independently evaluate it. Yeah. That's a great point, actually, that I've been also like kind of going through in my mind, which was, you know, in the beginning, you almost want to kind of give the responsibility to someone to give you some hints. And, but at some point you realize that's why there is all these groups, these paid groups, these YouTubers with a lot of followers and all this shit, basically. Yes. When, <laughs> when actually, when you go through all of that, you're like, most people don't know what they're doing. They don't have any control of anything. Yep. Some people act as if they do. Therefore, I'm, I kind of feel empowered because if I have my own opinion, it might be wrong, but, but I don't know less than other people because they don't know shit anyway, right? So it's kind of empowering. And then I, I'm always telling, the difference for me for this cycle, I mean, for this moment in time is I tell people, listen, this is what I'm doing. I'm not telling you should invest in crypto. I'm not telling you what you should do. This is what I'm doing. I'm telling you what I'm doing but I'm not telling you anything because before I was like, you should invest in crypto. It's the future of your internet. It's the future. What are you doing? I was like losing sleep over my ex-girlfriend who had money issue. And I was like, ah, she's missing out on this freaking opportunity. I can't believe it. My, so I was sending her some Bitcoin and everything. And then she ended up losing everything in freaking Celsius anyway. So like nothing made sense, right? Now yep. you're just like, this is my stuff. This is what I'm doing. I don't take any responsibility for anyone else. Yep. I don't give a fuck. Yep. But at least I'll sleep better at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I think this is also something you see quite common in crypto. People who have went through cycles, they yeah. kind of stop promoting it because yeah. the, 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 again, it's like there's <laughs> not too much upside for people who are willing to interested. They will naturally find a way to find the information. Absolutely. And, uh, but again, this also create a bad dynamic where people the who are willing to promote the most are those that least qualified to promote it. Yeah, on a YouTube or like all the people who promote Absolutely. the hardest oh my God. are the people who are least qualified to promote it, yeah. actually. It's weird. This whole dynamic is so completely It's also like a, like a very cliche <laughs> saying that it's like, when good guys do nothing, bad things happen. It is cliche, but it's actually quite true. Yeah. Yeah. What's your message for all the people out there who lost the fortune and feel at their lowest right now? So for these people that you said basically gave up, I think everyone need to come through a path of self-realization on, you know, what they actually want to do. Uh, and is this something they are still passionate about? And actually, are they really want to, you know, com committed to what they are doing? You know, if it's a yes, I think you should find a way to come back. Give it a try. Even if it doesn't work out, at least you give it a try and you can be responsible to yourself. Like you know it, deep down that you give it your best, even if it doesn't work out, it, it is fine. Yeah. So I, I think that's like, you do not want to, there's like a, the famous Zef Bezos phrase where he live on a regret minimization framework. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's quite true for most people, most entrepreneurs, like you want to minimize your regrets. And it applies a lot to happiness, I realized. Because uh, you go through this, you build businesses, you build wealth, then you lose some or a lot. And then you go through all these things and you can start to question like, what am I after? What makes me happy? And then you hopefully don't abandon and come back and build stuff. And you realize, oh man, actually like all these money or these things kind of like a side thing. Yes. What makes me so happy is that I know I'm working super hard towards something and that I get, I'm giving my best. And the outcome matters much less than the journey, but like the fact that I know I'm doing my best, it what makes me happy in the morning or in the evening. Yes. Even when things didn't work out. Yes. That day, like you feel really genuinely happy. Yep. And it's so much more basic. It's kind of so, like a much more basic framework of, of happiness than when we're being sold, yes. which is get the girls, get the money, get the whatever, yes. you know, all this shit, right? Yes. It's just like the internal happiness is, man, I'm trying to do something. I think it makes sense, at least to me. And I'm just giving my best. Yeah, 100%. We kind of touched upon that before, but when you, usually when things go bad, sometimes it takes a lot of time to realize, but at some point you realize that oh man, this was a blessing in disguise. Are you at that stage yet where you can say, what happened to me 
I mean, you're still doing obviously really well, but like what happened to me was actually an amazing learning that's going to make me, as you said, more fortitude, but like a much better person overall, or you're not there yet. No, I'm definitely there, uh, which is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a blessing in disguise. I would say it is a extremely valuable lesson, but perhaps a bit too expensive. <laughs> uh, I wish the, the price is not as expensive, the lesson uh, of, of this lesson, but it is a very valuable lesson that it, I basically, what I've been through in the past 18 months is what someone would probably only have go through if they spent at least 10 years in business. But I experienced all of that in less than two years. So in that sense, I get to speed run mm. a business and an entrepreneurship journey. Yeah, betrayed by your business partner in some sense, you know, you know, you got dragged down by people you resp you you think they they are much greater and successful than you that turn out that they actually are the one that turn out to be dragging you down, right? So you it's just like a so I, I, ironic, right? Where you actually think that they are actually bringing you up, but actually they're bringing you down. Um but uh can the lessons be learned in a cheaper manner? Yes. <laughs> so that that's kind of the 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 thing. Oh, one more thing is probably like very practical advice is legal fee is super expensive. Extremely expensive. So if you are anyone doing business entrepreneur, uh, you sometimes it's worth preventing a situation that you need to get into a, a litigation or like a legal situation that you save a lot of future costs, time. There is other kind of legal this. ways to sort a, 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 oh, yeah, so I mean, like, for not basically it's like, it might, like if you're doing, if you're signing or like, you know, preparing some important contract, it's actually better to make sure the contract is better prepared before you sign. Like I think, and I think this is actually a very common issue, even for like, you know a lot of established people, they sign a lot of things without actually looking at a lot yeah. of fine print. And it's also obviously that the whole fine print is so crazy that it's not possible to read everything. Yeah, which is why you get your lawyer to read it for you. Yeah, and obviously you make sure it's a good lawyer. Uh, yeah, and I think this is also like a practical advice part is like especially for co-founders, extremely important. When you do the when, like say you have co-founder right, you start a business. It's important to have a very clear clause on the shareholder agreement on what happened if one of the co-founder quit and not active anymore. Because mm -hmm. if you do not draft the agreement properly, he will continue to have a huge chunk of the ownership in the company while doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You need to have a clause where if he stopped committed, stop committing, no longer being active, his share will get bought out. That is a forced conversion clause. Okay. Yeah, like, and I think this is a lot of issue. Right? A lot of co-founder, one co-founder left, but he still have a lot of shares. Yeah, and what can yeah. he, he? He's not doing anything, and you cannot kick him out because he did contribute something in the beginning. I was talking about that with um, Johan from Wintermute the other day. He was like, "Oh yeah, we had this uh, co-founder. He did like I. He was the CTO for a year, year and a half, and oh, you know what it is? Like he got lucky, and like he got a good chunk." And then we ended up buying his shares, but later on, but like he got a really a good chunk of shares uh, for not doing much. And we only bought them like later on. So like this happens a lot to a lot of very successful people. Yeah, Actu yep. absolutely. Yep, yep. If you met the Arthur from 2019, what would, you, what would you tell him? So before you embarked on this crazy crypto journey? I would say, uh, I would tell him that it's even more important than ever to, uh, you know, not be influenced by external factors. When you make to when you are making a decision that concern yourself, like, um, you know, no, do not be you know external market environment influence influence you too much. You should have your own guiding principle and stick to it, and that is what matter the most, regardless of you know how crazy the market can get. Like, you know, yeah. Mm. We have a a new way to end up this podcast which is we ask the guests and you're actually the first one today I'm asking what's your prediction it could be any prediction crypto or non-crypto related for the next 12 months something you think is going to happen or something you think is not going to happen <laughs> that's uh, interesting I, I I will stick to crypto prediction because I think that is uh, my subject matter expert I think that 
crypto, regardless of what happened, will continue to grow. Uh, from like a uh, industry, we're going to continue to mature. Um, price will continue to go up. Might not be super crazy, but we will continue to go up. The industry will continue to mature, and we are gonna see something more useful. Uh, you know that normal people can interact with coming into the market, where it's something that normal consumer and user can interact and touch. It is coming mm. in the next 12 months and you will see it. In the next 12 months? Yes. Yeah. So you're talking about something like open AI style was for AI? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Like so something that you do not, you don't need to be a crypto fanatic to be willing to use it because it is an improvement over what you are using existing, like compared to the existing incumbents. Yeah. A prediction on the, at least, kind of sub-industry where it would be more likely? I think it will happen on the wallet management, uh, how you manage your crypto. You Most likely, there will be a lot of solution that is good enough that you do not need to note down the seed phrase. You do not need yeah. to remember the private key. There will be a lot of secure solution for you to manage your crypto asset in a self-custody way. Yeah, I think this is what will happen in the next 12 months because the technology is already there. They are just not popular and big enough for everyone to know that they exist and can use them. So the keywords here are smart wallets, right? Smart wallet, MPC wallets. Um, and so you're saying self-custody, but if you lose kind of the access, you still can access them, right? Uh, it's kind of like make it So for example, easy. you you can there will be some way that you can use your email to log in to your crypto wallet that is self-custody. Yeah. So you will only lose access to this if you lose your email. But obviously you know how to recover your email address, right? So the locking of this is tied to your email address. So okay. it's essential email address locking. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much for doing this, man. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.